I'd like to call this meeting to order. If you want to continue your conversations, if you could please uh, have them out in the hallway or keep your voices way low. This, uh, there's a lot of echo in this room and it's very difficult to hear the proceedings. Uh, at this time, I want to welcome, uh, I'm Councilmember Jose Weezer, Chair of the Planning, Land Use and Management Committee. Been uh, also present is Councilmember Felipe Fuentes and Councilmember Gilbert Cedillo. And with that, we will turn to item number 12, which is a report from the Director of Planning. Welcome. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Wizard, members of the, the uh, committee. I'll just be real brief today, given the size of our agenda. Um, we recently, re uh, the City Planning Department recently released environmental clearance for a proposed animal control ordinance that would be applicable to single family zones in five neighborhoods Brookside, Sherman Oaks, Sycamore Square, Pickford Village, and Wilshire Vista. So this is part of the um, city's overall efforts to make sure that the um, that development that's happening and the, the remodels and, and additions to homes in the single family neighborhoods are ha happening in a way that is, is consistent and sensitive to its surroundings. So we're hoping to have that, um, those ICOs before you um, shortly since we're able to um, circulate the environmental notice. So uh, with that, I conclude my report. Great, are there any uh, questions or comments? None. Thank you so much. Thank you for your work. We will receive and file item number 12. We will now turn to the consent calendar and um, all the consent items. All the consent items have cards. Eight, nine, ten. So we have no consent items and we'll go through them relatively quickly. Yes, uh, we do have a card on item 12. Herman Herman and uh, public speaker, you are here on every item at every meeting. I would remind you to please speak uh, to the topic at hand and I'm going to let you know now that I am only gonna give you one warning if you continue to disrupt this meeting throughout this meeting and then I will ask our officers to escort you out if you disrupt this meeting. Thank you. Number 12. Now you folks are here for the reports on ongoing development in the city of Los Angeles. And we say and we question, how was any one of these planning commissioners able to win support to develop in our communities with our, our consent? Are we not open to the business of the city of Los Angeles as it harms our taxes, as it adds to our community? So these are very important issues. Although I do not strictly stay on topic because I follow the Ralph Brown Act, 54950, and i just like to remind you that why did no one try to stop redevelopment to force the problem of homeless in our, in our communities? It's a question they must address. It's a question they must do something about the harm they brought upon the homeless population. There are over 7,000 homeless people from USC to here within a five mile radius. Pretty pathetic. Thank you. We will receive a file item number 12. Item number five, if you could read that into the record. And I know we have uh, Council Member Bond in here for item number three. We will take that item up right after the um, consent calendar. Uh, item number five, you can read that in the record, please. Five, Councilman, this is a planning commission uh, recommended zone change ordinance for a property located in CD4. It's for a new four-story hotel. Thank you. Herman? What item, sir? Five. The Quality Act findings report dealing with CD4, another poverty pimp, for the demolition of an existing surface parking lot another parking lot demolition. We gave up parking lots here on, on Fiesta Broadway for developers to redevelop with broken promises, CRLA. They really did us in, those douchebags. So keep in mind, there are 94 guest rooms with approximately 46,860 square feet without a personal view 
to imply that homeless people need homes, the elderly need home, and those of us on a very tight budget need a home. So don't forget, development only creates higher taxes and pushes you into the street. Thank you. Keep your three seconds. Homelessness. Thank you. Uh, we, any objections to this item? See none. So ordered. Approved. Item number six. Sure. Item six, Councilman. This is a report from the South Valley APC. Again, it's a zone change uh, for property in CD3 to demolish one single family dwelling and construct a 12 unit apartment building. Thank you. One public comment card. Herman. Yeah, here's another issue, folks, NWA style. We're looking at a, a, a real um, quality act, or I find it as the findings say, quality of life under CEQA. But the offensive approach of this is to destroy existing family dwellings in our residential communities. Where does it put all of you? Those of you who are elderly, where does it put any of you who are real taxpayers that own a home? home ownership. Eventually, you'll be out on the street. Because if you're blind to any personal view of what's happening around Los Angeles, take a look at every freeway exit. Homelessness. Thank you, Governor Brown. Jerry. Thank you. Any objections to item number six? Seeing none, so ordered as approved. Item number eight. Sure. Item eight, Councilman, this is... Uh Report from the City Planning Commission recommending adoption of the Toluca Lake Community Design uh, uh, Regulations. Thank you. One public comment card. Herman. Mr. Speaker, you said that was uh, item eight? Eight. Great. Great, 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 great. We're looking at areas of consisting parcels Frontage to Riverside Drive, really, I, I don't care if it's in Riverside Drive, because every, everything that changes our, um, our taxes, anything that changes parcels from R2 to high density, it impacts us all, NWA. So if our elected officials are not really planning for the future to incorporate us elderly, us disabled, those of you who know that it's very hard today to find that your gas company or DWP are, are going to give us breaks, then can you just think about how expensive it is for a single family neighborhood, South Alley B to the south? What a damn shame. Thank you. Any objections to this item? Seeing none, so ordered as approved. Next and final item on consent is item 10. Item 10, Councilman, this is a report from the Cultural Heritage Commission relative to the inclusion of the Arcady Apartments in CD1 as a historic cultural monument. Thank you. One public comment card. Herman? What item, sir? 10. NWA. NWA. It's on the next page. A time limit regarding the last day for Council's action, regarding the report of Cultural Heritage Commission, which I and Mr. Wayne Spindler, an attorney from Encino, have participated in over 50 to 100 of these commission meetings to save historical monuments that we all appreciate in our community, right? We're sick and tired of this density issue. We're trying to preserve our communities, not destroy. So thank you, Mr. Spindler, for all the wonderful comments you made regarding apartments, monuments, culture, our community, especially more so on Wilshire Boulevard, where Peppa Pig, Paul Koretz lives. I hold my time and wave the remaining to you, sir. Bye. Thank you. Any objections to this item? Seeing none, so ordered as approved. Okay, we will now go to item number three. Okay. Item three, Councilman, this is a report uh, relative to a, a specific plan amendment 
uh, for property located in CD 11 for a mixed use project. Great, thank you. And uh, Mr. Co Mr. Bonin, uh, as is, um, we typically ask the staff to present the project first, uh, but as a courtesy to our council members, we also offer them the opportunity to speak beforehand. At your pleasure, if you'd rather speak beforehand, that's fine with us. Yeah, I'll speak okay, now. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, colleagues, members of the committee, thank you very much uh, for hearing this matter today. Spending some time on a Tuesday afternoon discussing a development project in CD11 is uh, something very familiar to you. Uh, but discussing a project that has such deep, widespread, comprehensive, enthusiastic, and lopsided support among members of the community is probably something you're a little bit less familiar with. That's the kind of project I'm here talking about today, and it's a project I'm here to offer my enthusiastic endorsement of. Uh, the project before you today, the Palisades Village project, brought uh, uh, forth by Rick Caruso and his team, uh, is bringing back an active and a vibrant Main Street to Pacific Palisades. Pacific Palisades, for those of you not familiar with it, is sort of a picture-perfect uh, postcard-type community, but its downtown has become run down over the past few years. And one of the things I have heard back since I was a candidate is, how can we fix our downtown? And this project before you is one that does that, and does that in, in a major way. Uh, it reinvigorates uh, the downtown for Pacific Palisades. The project is sensitively scaled. It's a development that does something I usually have to wrestle with developers to do. And that is they're building actually less than they're entitled to do, and they have listened to and addressed and incorporated all sorts of concerns from the community. Uh, part of that, i got to say, is due to the incredible personal touch of Rick Caruso and his team, who met with folks in their living rooms uh, and in their neighborhoods and talked about what folks really needed. You know, when members of the community came out in droves at one of the town hall meetings on this project and said, we would like a movie theater here so we don't have to drive to Santa Monica uh, or as far away as the Grove to see a movie, they listened and they incorporated that. When the young kids in the community said, we would love an ice cream store here in Palisades Village, they listened and there's going to be an ice cream store there. That's the approach they've taken uh, from the very beginning. They have listened and they've incorporated suggestions from the community from the early hearings all the way up to uh, CPC. Uh, and it remains uh, true even today where they continue to listen. Uh, they have agreed uh, with uh, suggestions that they add back into their project a community room for uh, use by the community and that they provide a third level of subterranean parking. Uh, I want to make it clear I wholeheartedly support those two improvements to the project uh, and, and want those incorporated in here with the, the applicant's cooperation. Um, to make sure that the ongoing and positive cooperative relationship between the applicant and the community continues uh, and make sure that it's operated in a truly sensitive way and meets the needs of the community, I'm asking the committee uh, with the applicant's agreement to add one more condition to the project. And that uh, language has been submitted to you by my staff. I'm asking that you require that the applicant prepare an operations management plan that will guide how the project is operated so the community can really truly be, uh, the project can really truly be a first class neighbor. I believe uh, that you all have that specific language by now. If not, you'll get it in just a second. I should also note that while I have never in all my years in city government seen a project in my district that has had support this lopsided and this widespread in a community, support is not 100% unanimous. There are a few folks who have some concerns, and those mo mostly focus on whether or not Swarthmore should be a one-way street or a two-way street. Uh, I support the applicant's uh, request to turn it into a one-way street. I think it's much better uh, for the community. I think it's safer for pedestrians, for cyclists, and it'll create more on-street parking. Uh, but there are some folks uh, who live in the nearby area who are concerned about what impacts those may have. So I do want to encourage the applicant in the operations plan that they're uh, going to develop uh, to um, Put in, to put in place management plans to uh, guide trips to and from the project, particularly along Swarthmore, taking into careful consideration uh, what the, the ingress and egress patterns would be uh, uh, and how they may affect the residential neighborhood, sort of coning things off and guiding people away from the neighborhood. Um, and, and with that, that would be really the, the, those would be the only things I would ask as changes in this. I, I will note that 
you know, every time you have a big project in your district, you get tons of questions. People are always coming up and asking certain questions about this. The question I have gotten most consistently about this project from day one up until just a few minutes ago is when the heck are they going to break ground? When is it going to start? And when will Palisades Village be open for us to enjoy? So I wholeheartedly endorse this project uh, and ask for uh, your support today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bonin. Um, and with that, we will now go to a staff presentation on this item. Welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Lakeisha Hall, and I'm with the Department of City Planning. I will be presenting the entitlements for the proposed project, um, and I would probably need about four minutes because there's a lot of information that we have worked on with the community and with the applicant um, to get the project to where it is today. So I'm the staff person assigned to case number CPC 2015-2715 VCC SPP SP DRB. So as you can see, there's quite a few entitlements associated to this project. Um, over 11th month period, um, the project has evolved into um, what would be considered as a master plan, very comprehensive planning project. On April 28th, 2016, the City Planning Commission acted on several entitlements for the proposed project, which include the vesting zone change, specific plan amendments, design review, specific plan, project permits compliance, um, the readoption of the M&D, and they also sustained the Deputy Advisory Agency's action of approving the parcel map. The proposed project, as approved by the City Planning Commission, includes the demolition of existing commercial buildings and surface parking lots to permit the construction of a mixed-use development with one- and two-story two buildings. The proposed project includes a mix of uses for a total of 116,215 square feet, and those uses include retail, restaurants, offices, eight residential units, a specialty grocery store, walk-in bank, a movie theater, a community room, and two levels of subterranean parking for a total of 470 parking spaces. The proposed project is on a 3.11 acre site, and it's located off of North Swarthmore Avenue, North Monument Street, Sunset Boulevard, and the Brentwood Pacific Palisades Community Plan Area. Now, I will briefly go over the vesting zone change and the specific plan amendments for the project. The applicant is requesting a vesting zone change from C21VL and R3P1VL to TQC21VL, which is consistent with the de designated general plan land use of community commercial. The requested zone change is also consistent with the surrounding and abutting properties, and they are also already developed with commercial, multifamily, and single-family residential units. Now, there is an existing specific plan um, where the site is located. And the applicant is requesting amendments to the existing Pacific Palisades Commercial Village and Neighborhood Specific Plan. Those amendments include new definitions for architectural roof features, building height, um, a definition for marquee sign, and a definition for public access way. Um, the other amendment is to create a new commercial village sub-area, which will include specific sign regulations or a master sign program alcohol use conditions, and streetscape designs for streets that are abutting or um, traversing through the project. There's also streetscape designs to change Swarthmore Avenue from a two-way to a one-way street. CPC's recommend recommendation to Plum is to approve the requested specific plan text amendments and to also approve the requested vesting zone change um, subject to the T's and Q's. In closing, you should have received um, with your packet uh, an M&D addendum and supplemental findings to the case file um, as presented by planning to address minor changes that the applicant will be presenting to Plum today. This completes my presentation and I'm here for any questions regarding the staff report um, and the additional requested actions. Great, thank you. Any questions at this time? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. We will now turn to public comment and the first uh, speaker card is from the applicant, uh, Rick Caruso. Welcome, Mr. Caruso. And um, applicants have five minutes. All other public speakers have one minute, so you could wish to use those five minutes if you wish. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will be brief. Members of council, thank you for your time. Uh, this project is a very important project to me for a whole host of reasons, um, one of which is that I live down the street uh, in Brentwood, 
So I have approached this project with great humility and deference to the community, which we do with everyone, but it's also a project that I look forward to enjoying. Uh, having a street is something wonderful and special, as you all know, great streets are near and dear to my heart. The opportunity to improve Swarthmore is an exciting opportunity. Unfortunately, the existing street is sad and doesn't reflect the Palisades community. It's been neglected for years, has also had contamination issues, which we have cleaned, and we look forward to bringing new life to the community. We have listened to the community. The community is smart. They know what they want. They want a sustainable project, a project that is environmentally responsible. They want it safe for their families, pedestrian friendly. They'd like to have new restaurants, a grocer, a neighborhood theater, outdoor park, etc. And we plan on giving them all of that. Their theater that they want, we're bringing back the Old Bay Theater that operated some 50 years ago. And we're excited to bring back a local community theater, a theater where people will be able to walk to see a movie, grab dinner, and then walk home. The original theater was designed by Charles Lee. We have found the original drawings, and we look forward to bringing that back to life. The park area is going to be the heartbeat of this project, open to the community. We're taking out an unsightly asphalt surface parking lot and turning it into a beautiful park area with restaurants overlooking it. We have a few residential units, which we're excited about, that people have an opportunity to live here. And it's also important to note that this project complies with all the city plans, including the 16 policies of the community plan, all parking requirements, in fact, overpark now that we're adding an additional level of parking. The square footage, as the councilman said, is half of what we're allowed. There are no traffic impacts, significant traffic impacts uh, on the project. The goal is to be LEED compliant, rooftop solar panels, electric vehicle stations, configured for 100 stalls, bike facilities, a bike share program, recycle demolition. And on top of it, we have followed all the recommendations given to us over meetings with well over a few thousand of the local residents. We are increasing the landscaping. We remove second floors adjacent to single family homes. We've eternalized all the loading and the service, reduced the building heights, We've designed the intersections to be more pedestrian friendly. We've worked with the Pride community to incorporate the sidewalk titles. We've reconfigured the apartments, added the community room, and on and on and on. And because of that, we're proud of the broad support that we have. So uh, I think there's some technical points that I am required to ask of you. Is that true? OK. Let me get those. Michael, do you have those? Ah, I've got them. So the um, request is that following the City Planning Commission hearing in April, we made improvements to the project plans based on community feedback that we have submitted for your consideration. The minor changes include the addition of a third level of subterranean parking, which alleviates community concerns regarding parking for the project, minor increase in floor area for the eight residential units, addition of a community room, the proposed addition is accommodated within the existing building envelope. The changes have been analyzed in an addendum to the adopted mitigated negative deck prepared by the city. The amended, the addendum concluded that the changes fall within the envelope of impacts analyzed by the MMD, adopted by the City Planning Commission. In fact, all impact levels remain the same as identified in the adopted mitigated negative deck. In order to implement the revised plans, we request to modify CPC's recommended Q conditions, number one, two, and four, which we have also submitted for your consideration. We respectfully ask Plum Committee to approve the proposed minor revisions to the project plans and conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
will now turn to the remainder of the public comments. I'll call three people up at a time. You could line up uh, behind the speaker. Christina Spitz, David Kaplan, and Rosalie Huntington. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Christina Spitz. I'm president of Pacific Palisades Community Council, or PPCC. PPCC is the most broad-based community organization in Pacific Palisades. We effectively function as a neighborhood council for the Palisades and have been the voice of the community since 1973. PPCC strongly supports the Palisades Village project. Our position was reached after extensive review and discussion and the nearly unanimous vote of our board is a decision unprecedented in PPCC's history. PPCC also wishes to express great appreciation to Caruso Aff Affiliated for its incredible outreach efforts, which have led to an overwhelming community consensus and strong support of the project. The PPCC board urges you to recommend approval of this fantastic and much needed project to the full council. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, council members. My name is David Kaplan. I'm here to enthusiastically support this project. As chair of the PPCC Village Planning Land Use Committee, we held several large public meetings. Support for the project was both vast and broad-based. Carissa Affiliated has been both sensitive to community needs and open to change, as exemplified by their willingness to put in additional parking, a true benefit for the community. This is a revitalization that will be a major benefit to all. I urge you to approve this. Thank you. Thank you. Rosalie Huntington. Okay, who dropped that? Everybody's pointing fingers at each other. Rosalie Huntington. Yes. Laurie Sale. Herman. Okay, and I'm going to give you uh, this. I have email. Great, thank you. Okay. Of deep concern is the architectural style. The area that Caruso Affiliated is demolishing is original mid-century modern, which uh, did not attain historic status because of some changes in facades over the years and materials, but it still remains that, that style. And we're proud to say mid-century modern, partially developed in Pacific Palisades. I'm going to go straight to... Uh, an example of light poles, street light poles, that Caruso wants to use. They have no connection whatsoever with the area. Instead, they look like they belong in merry old England, not Pacific Palisades. The Design Review Board and the Planning Commission understand that. The DRB requested, and the Planning Commission is requiring, that Mr. Caruso incorporate mid-century modern flavor in his design. So he has added one beautifully designed building, in the northern end, I don't know if any more are designed like that. Planning Commission wants other designs which will create a visual jumble, including Art Deco. Great. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Laurie Sale. I'm the executive director of the newly formed Pacific Palisades Business Improvement District. I'm also a resident of the Palisades for more years than I want care to admit. And um, I have been involved with various building projects around the city, and I have never in my life encountered anyone as conscientious, as caring, as open, transparent, and helpful as the Caruso affiliate team. I, the bid to full fully supports this project and can't wait for it to get started. And as a resident, I am really looking forward to spending my days in the village, uh, spending my money, and enjoying the beautiful thing that Mr. Caruso is building. Thank you. Thank you. Herman Nicole Howard, Howard Donna Vaccarino. We will all should support Mr. Caruso's uh, vision to a new building, a new era to stage what goes on in the affluent areas on the far west side of the shores. But we know that Mr. Caruso, one time police commissioner, did a great job for all us poverty, poor people. So I'm sure he's going to imply every issue of the American Disability Act in all his projects. It's going to look so beautiful. Mr. Sedil and I are going to roll down the street in our wheelchairs with our mothers side by side. And yeah, 
NWA knows how to roll with Caruso. So put Caruso in front of the project, expedite his project ahead of, ahead of the demand, and cut the red tape. Cut the red tape. Because this nigga knows how to roll. Keep your time. Thank you, Caruso. Don't encourage him. Nicole Howard. Yeah, I'm afraid I'm not as colorful. Um, <laughs> my name is Nicole Howard. I uh, have been a resident of Pacific Palisades for 20 years. I've raised two boys and still raising two boys. And I'm here today representing a lot of the residents that couldn't be here. There is, well, I'm in the upper alphabet section, which is right next to the project. And uh, I just wanted to say that I really hope you approve it as is and move it forward because we overwhelmingly can't wait to have this. It is long overdue. Thank you so much. Thank you. Donna Vaccarino and someone called PDQ. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Donna Vaccarino. I'm an architect. Um, I'm also a member of the Design Review Board in Pacific Palisades and a longtime resident of the community. I live in the house I first came to when I was born almost 70 years ago. Um, and it's in the Alphabet Streets. There are special moments in history that define how we do things. Losing the DRB, the public review at the local level, has curtailed the breadth and depth of discussion making final decisions based on partial review that did not properly evaluate the effects and the magnitude of the project, the unintended consequences on our community is unfair and unjust. The review of this project uh, outside of the DRB has moved incredibly fast. It is an example of spot zoning for the benefit of the developer. I would ask that Plum and the council review and present the management plan suggested by Bonin, so the community may evaluate that. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. PDQ? Yeah, PDQ Publishers of Inglewood. They're here to support the project, because over down there in my ghetto in Encino, Rick Caruso came on Havenhurst and Ventura and bulldozed it all down and made it nice. And when I'm over there, when I'm receiving my EBT card, I get free Wi-Fi over there at the Kinko's and over there at the Starbucks. And all my other brothers, they all wait for the bus and they get the same free Wi-Fi. It's all nice and clean and the neighbors love it. Rick Caruso likes the neighborhood. Now he's going over to CD11 and then hopefully one day, provided some of us aren't going to be in prison for the next four years and purge your charges, they, Rick Caruso could go to CD 8, 9, and 10 and do the same wonderful job he's going to be doing over there number 11. So support all of us, every one of us down and up in all classes and support the project. Thank you. Thank you. So um, any questions or comments? If I could, uh, thank you. There's been a motion to approve and we'll second that. Um, on the... I assume you're moving it, Mr. Cedillo, with the, the amendment pro the uh, amendment by CD13 and the technical amendments as CD proposed. I'm sorry, sorry, 11. It says number 13 up here. Uh, by CD11 and the technical amendments uh, as proposed by the applicant. On the technical amendments, uh, planning department, have you reviewed these? And would you concur with these? Yes, we reviewed the technical amendments by CD11 and also by the applicant. Are you okay with them? Yes. yes. Okay. How about CD11, the technical amendments? Um, have you had a chance to review them, the ones that were verbally presented by the applicant? Yes, we have reviewed those and we also concur with them. Okay, good. All right. So with that, uh, uh, yes. In, in addition, Councilman, you need to request the city attorney to prepare the specific plan amendment ordinance. Okay, we'll uh, move to approve with the amendments, the techno amendments made by the applicant and the one amendment on the operations and management plan as proposed by CD11 and request the city attorney to prepare the specific plan ordinance. Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yes. 
the amendments by the applicant, those are different than the amendments by CD11? Yes. Are those amendments affecting the queue conditions? The uh, one by, proposed by the applicants, I believe they affect the queue they conditions. Affect they affect the queues one, two, and four. That would require a new zone change ordinance. So we would request a uh, drafting of a zone change ordinance by the... Planning. By planning, yes. not the city attorney. Okay, by planning. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Any other discussion on this? Any objections to this item? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. It seems like it's a wonderful project. Thank you very much. Okay. We could now turn to item number 11, please. Item 11, Councilman, is a uh, Cultural Heritage Commission recommendation to include uh, uh, an apartment building uh, located in CD14 as a historic cultural monument. On this item, we actually were interested in staff here on this item? Yes. Just a br brief procedural overview of this project, please, if you have that with you. Yes, this is uh, Ken Bernstein, Department of City Planning staff. What's before you is Historic Cultural Monument nomination for the Fort uh, Pettibone Building mm -hmm. at uh, 510 to 514 South Broadway. The Cultural Heritage Commission recommendation is that the property reflects the broad cultural or economic uh, and social history of the community for its association with the Fort Pettibone Company. Uh, from 1905 to 1924, the company that designed and manufactured the first incandescent street lighting system in Los Angeles. Great, thank you. And colleagues, I'm always very pleased to see an interest in the restoration and reuse of our downtown historic buildings. And here I am especially excited to see this nomination initiated by the property owners, no less, for a beautiful structure on Broadway with an interesting industrial history. Uh, I would ask that we move to approve the recommendation for Cultural Heritage Commission to designate the property a historic cultural monument and would like to direct the City Planning Department to process a pending Mills Act application for this property during this calendar year since as a historic cultural monument the property uh, will potentially qualify. So, or will qualify. Okay, it's been moved by Mr. Cedillo. Any objections? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you very much. Oh, we have, I'm sorry, we have public comment on this. Herman? I'm sorry, we have the applicant here. So, oh, no, we have somebody who's, yeah, Daniel Neiman first. Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. I didn't see your cards here. Good afternoon. Thank you for your consideration. We've been working with staff and uh, building and safety to get this project in order. Uh, we anticipate being able to pull a building permit soon. And uh, the HCM nomination and the Mills Act will go a long way to help us renovating this property. And uh, we'd be glad to answer any questions if there are any. Yep. I don't think we have any questions. Thank you. Herman? What item number are we on? 11. Well, as you see, another monument building located at 5110, 5514 South Broadway in the historic cultural monument area. Shame on you, Mr. Weezar. Shame on you. You still have not complied with Wolves versus Los Angeles in regards to making the area more successful for those who are disabled, for ramps and curb cuts, along the fish corridor area there where you have an illegal ramp for pedestrians to sit on the sidewalk or the curbside. But the issue here today has to do with the bum who has allowed such a report from the Cultural Heritage Commission relative to the inclusion of PD Bone Building. PD Bone, Boner Building, it doesn't matter. We need housing for the homeless. Fight the war, the crisis on homeless. Fight the war. The crisis on homeless. 
PDQ. Yeah, well, I do, don't really know about much about Mother history, but I would want to tell you that I think that it's very important to take and do the other thing necessary to get those permits approved on them old houses. Used to be, oh, back a hundred years ago, it was all unicultural. A bunch of bunch of white folk all living there and building them big houses, three, four, five thousand square foot homes, back during the day. But 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 today it costs a housing so much, most of us we just go settle for a little box. So it's good to know that you're gonna be proving all them other projects there to be taking the old history houses and be putting them up there. So while my, most of us folks are, are, are on our ABG cards and on, on a plug and out of prison, that we can go down there and watch all them beautiful white houses where all them white folk used to live there. there that'd be real nice. So I thoroughly think that I support this project. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Any um, questions or comments on this? Uh, we've um, moved to approve. So ordered. Thank you. Item number one. Item one, Councilman. This is a communication from the mayor relative to the appointment of Mana Sutton to the Harbor Area Planning Commission. Okay. Um, thank you. Welcome, Ms. Sutton. Are you here? Ms. Welcome. If you could come up to the back. Thank you so much for agreeing to serve be nominated to serve on the Harbor Area Planning Commission. We see from your resume that you're very active and involved in the community and we all certainly appreciate that. And if you could just share anything you would like with the committee and uh, your interest in serving on this commission. Um, thank you. I'm really pleased to be here and very pleased um, to be standing in front of you as a nominee and an appointee um, to the Harbor Area Planning Commission. I've lived in the San Pedro area, in the Harbor area, for a little over 25 years. And um, I think my biggest interest in being on the board is that as I've watched from a stakeholder point of view, as well as a small business owner point of view, um, I own a, a local eatery that I've built um, from a little tiny cafe to um, being a brick and mortar restaurant where people come from all over to eat. But from somebody that's not a born and raised person for five generations from that area, I've been privy to, um, as an outsider and somebody that travels greatly all over, I've been really lucky in my life to see port areas from all over the world from a perspective of uh, small ones to large ones, industrialized ones and underdeveloped ones. And for me, I've had a tremendous desire to see thoughtful, thoughtful uh, development and certainly we now have um, our ports of call uh, development in place and signed um, and so we've many of us and myself most importantly have wanted to see a destination a first-class de destination and have wanted more uh, we've wanted more um, investment from big box uh, corporations and we've also wanted to have our small businesses take pride in what they have. And so where I come from the leadership point of view is, is that I've never accepted our fate. And I've worked very diligently as um, you see my resume, perhaps there in front of you, I've worked really diligently for quality of life issues, partnering with um, the LAPD at the Harbor Division, being their chair of Community Police Advisory Board and their spokesperson for the greater Harbor area of Harbor City, Wilmington, um, as well as San Pedro. So, and I also come from a design background, um, and I was appointed by the great by um, Mayor Garcetti for the Great Streets Project, the first one that's named in the Harbor area. And I'm currently also going to be serving on the phase one, two, and three for the next phases um, of development and conceptual planning. And I'm also uh, uh, co-chair of the new uh, P bid uh, that we're currently in concept and moving forward on. So. With that being said, um, I have a lot of um, wants, needs, and desires from a lot of stakeholders um, that I have my voice for thoughtful, careful planning and for forward progressive thought. So I'm proud to be thought of uh, for this position and um, will serve um, with great pride. Great, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments for the nominee? 
Sure. Moved by Mr. Fuentes, second by Mr. Harris Dawson. And any objections? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate it. And this item is going to council. Um, it's in council tomorrow. Tomorrow. It's in council tomorrow. We will see you in council tomorrow. Thank you. Congratulations. Yes, we forgot public comment. Uh, we did. W.S. Spindler? On item number one? No, if you I could uh, reconsider that item, please, in taking public comment. Yeah, yeah, PDQ Publishers of Inglewood. Yes, I think it's real nice that, that you allow business owners to commingle their funding with your city funding to get more stuff built. And I think that's the Chicago model. We don't want the, the, the New York City model. We want more of the Chicago model. And the Chicago model is pay to play 24 Mr. 7 Spindler, a day. Mr. Spindler, this is on item number one, right. an appointment to the but that, that, Harbor Area Planning yeah, that, Commission. That, that, you could stay on topic, please. You, you, got a, you, uh, you got a person that owns a business and they want to be on a planning commission. And, and that's why I'm saying you got to have a minimum net value and net worth of about $100 million combined in your business district. And she just in the goddamn business, and now she's going to be on the panel to move some city money over to her side of the block. Now, what is wrong with that? In L.A., that's not illegal. That is encouraged. I am a supporter of corruption, and vote yes on this. PDQ? Oh, so interesting. While well, I was today at the one o'clock meeting under innovation grants and technology commerce, because it dealt with the San Pedro area, a development only worth 85 to 100 million dollars. And what about the 52 million dollars for public right of way? NWA, my friends, that's where I live. Little Negro boy like me from Boyle Heights, growing up with all my family and friends. Got my ass kicked out into the street. So what can I be a part of this technology agency? I wasn't there when Miss, uh, what's the lady's name that just stepped around who got that nice promotion? Isn't that sweet? Double dipping in government business. But we, we, we folks don't play that kind of BS games because I don't want to use profanity because some people get their feelings hurt when I use the outreach of selective choice of words here. But once again, I go beyond the line of that discretion because I follow the law. Okay, thank you. We reconsidered item number one to take in public comment the action stance. I don't know if that's allowed under Robert's rules, but you know what I mean, right? So, city attorney's looking at me confused. So, we'll now go to item number nine. <laughs> Procedurally, I'm sorry, procedurally that was okay, right? The city attorney just taking in public comment. We forgot it. Do we have to reconsider? Well, you just were correcting that, that you meant to do that first. Okay. Thank you very much. So, item number nine. Item nine, councilman, this is a planning commission recommended uh, a project. It's, it includes various entitlements, zone change, conditional use, zoning administrator, determination, and a variance. It's to demolish part of the commercial space and to rehab uh, the remaining commercial space. This is located in CD7. And it has uh, two associated appeals. Okay, staff here on this item, please. Uh, good afternoon, uh, committee members. Oliver Neppern with the Department of City Planning. Uh, so the case that you have before you today is a uh, redevelopment of a existing shopping center um, with a uh, about 30,000 square foot addition to that shopping center. Uh, included in the um, project was a general plan amendment, uh, a zone change, conditional use for hours of operation, uh, conditional use for the sale of alcohol, three variance requests for uh, off-street parking, for signage, and for loading access from an alley. Um, and that was all, the entitlement request. Um, the, this went to commission, uh, our city planning commission, for approval and was unanim unanimous, unanimously approved. Um, 
and subsequently there were two appeals uh, filed on the uh, approval. Those appeals were related to the conditional use uh, approvals and the zone variance approvals. Um, in the Commission's action and in staff's recommendation to Commission, uh, we found that the uh, conditional, uh, conditional uses were appropriate for the site given the conditions that we were imposing and that those uh, conditions that the Commission had agreed to. Uh, as it relates to the zone variance specifically, uh, one of the requests was to um, allow for the project to not take access from an alley. Um, one of the appeal points uh, was that um, the project was now requiring access from the alley um, when in fact the zone variance request was specifically to allow for access to come from, uh, from the street and not from the alley. So with that, uh, staff would uh, recommend that you um, deny the uh, appeals and you uh, grant the project as approved by City Planning Commission. Great. Thank you very much. Mr. Fuentes, why not, um, pro, uh, do uh, we go comments. to public comment, then you, okay. There's okay. two appeals. Great. Thank you. So the uh, appellants, Dean Anderson. Appellants and the applicants each have five minutes and all of the public comment has one minute. So Mr. Anderson, you have five minutes to present. Thank you. Uh, Plum Commission, uh, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It, it appears to be a, a reasonably project, but just, there's some issues that I have concern with. Uh, one of them is the uh, 15342 and 15354 West San Jose. That is uh, going to be zoned to C21. Those used to be two uh, residential homes. Now, those can be zoned for entertainment, hotels. I guess right now it's going to be some kind of warehouse and store. I mean, I just, uh, that did used to be two uh, residential homes. They also mentioned uh, they want to use the driveway on Columbus Avenue that is uh, going into a residential street. I measured the uh, diameter of that street, and it's less than 30 feet. So if you're going to use that alley to a residential street for commercial delivery for that shopping center, you know, if the street's less than 30 feet and maybe a car is, what, seven foot wide with the mirrors or eight foot wide, I mean, you're getting to somewhere around 15 feet, 15 feet or less that you have for clearance of vehicles. Seems kind of dangerous to be in allowing uh, commercial vehicles because commercial vehicles are pretty huge. I mean, you know, because you're going to have people parking there all the time now. I think that needs to be really looked at because uh, you're going to have somebody injured. And the street does not even have a street light. So uh, that's something to think about because of safety. And somebody's eventually going to get hurt there. The uh, also mentioned that the application of zoning uh, would result in a hardship. Uh, I don't know where the hardship came from. There was none listed. I also would like to mention the uh, tr trash can should be 60 feet. I, bet, I think they're doing it at 40 feet because they're in an enclosure. I would like to request you keep the 60 feet. Basically, the trash cans are behind my home, and I know how loud they can get because of the, uh, you know, you've got cans, bottles, and not to mention a pickup truck, a uh, truck that lifts this stuff up and slams it down because they're in a hurry. They're going to slam it down to get all the trash out as quick as possible. The, uh, also, I noticed there's a thing on graffiti for this project. We've uh, got it surrounded by fencing right now, but I've seen some of this graffiti. It's, it's been up there for five days to, uh, you know, there seems to be a lot of it lately. So just giving you a heads up on that, you know, I mean, it did mention 24 hours, and we're getting a lot of graffiti. I don't know why. I went to a neighborhood council meeting the other, yesterday, and the police knows about it, so I guess we're working on that. I would... Uh, Really like you to look at the commercial deliveries through that, that alleyway to Columbus Avenue. That is a uh, big issue. Again, I mentioned that street is less than 30, 30 uh, you take away the curb, it's probably 29 feet or less. So you've you're got less than 15 feet for two commercial vehicles to come through. Seems kind of dangerous, not to mention there's no street light there. Uh, thanks for uh, letting me speak. Uh, good day. Kendra Casper is listed as a representative. Is that a councilman? There's another appellant. Oh, there's another appellant. I'm sorry. Yes. I don't have your card, ma'am. What's your name? It's Linda Romney, 
And I'd like to give the board, uh, as has already been given in writing, a uh, violation of the Browns Act. Specifically, the agenda speaks to part appeal, and in fact, it was an entire appeal. Uh, personally, uh, filed the timely appeal on April 25th. Hermie Augustine, under coercion, refused to accept the entire appeal and required for filing that it be changed, and he changed the original. Thereafter, on, my, on May 9th, his boss, senior city planner Ralph Avila, in front of us stated to Mr. Hermie Augustine, I've spoken to you before regarding this, and you're in error. They are allowed to do the entire, as they are allowed to comment on queue conditions in addition. And that's exactly what we were requiring to do. I hired an attorney. I have been deprived of due process because that brief could not be presented to you, although we were verbally notified that the applications would be changed to attire, and they were not. However, your senior city planner, Ralph Avila, had us in front of him change the file copy to state entire. This has been brought to your attention, as the fact is that the notice did not go out until May 13th. We were aware of it as of the 9th, as was the city. And therefore, you do not have the brief in front of you, and I cannot comment as to the actual issues. We wish to appeal the entire action, the brief, I've paid the attorneys, and it's ready to be presented. Therefore, I'm requesting a continuance. Thank you. Thank you. Can you do me a favor and fill out your card and uh, give it to the city clerk for the record? We need that for our record since I didn't have one up here for you. Thank right, you. except I'm not, waiving, I'm not waiving my rights. I'm just telling you of your violation of the Browns Act. I have okay. not waived the rights, and I'm not commenting on the specifics. What I'm stating is the city made a mistake. They've never notified me if there is such a mistake from the entire to partial, and the agenda should have been corrected, and it has not. Therefore, I cannot comment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and so for our records, we're going to indicate that uh, the uh, um, Linda Rodman, as she stated, uh, um, um, did not agree to fill out a comment card for our own records. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Huizar, um, I think the confusion stems from the legislative actions are not appealable. They just come up by operation of law pursuant to the charter and the code but the quasi-judicial entitlements are appealable. Okay. So that's the difference. So but anybody has the right to speak on the legislative matters today as well as the appeal. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Kendra Casper, are you the representative for the property owners and applicant? I have a number of people listed here as property owners, so for t for purposes of our five-minute allocation, sure. I just need to know who I will... I represent the applicant. You, okay, yes. great. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, honorable council members. My name is Kendra Casper. I'm here representing the applicant of the project. Um, in regards to the appeals, we submitted a response to the appeals last week uh, for the record. So today I'm only going to speak um, about the vast community outreach we did for this project. Uh, we also wanted to thank Oliver and the, uh, all the planners who did all their very, very hard work on this project and we appreciate all their help and uh, we agree with everything that uh, he said in his presentation today. Uh, we convened our neighborhood council outreach starting in 2011. We also surveyed close to 1,000 residents before we even made plans for the redevelopment of the project and listened to the community, uh, I their input in, in making this project what it is today. For example, they asked us to keep Millie's restaurant and, and we've kept that in the project for the community. There's a number of other things, that's just one example. Um, the Neighborhood Council also issued a, a letter of support for the project. Uh, we canvassed uh, Mission Hills, the entire neighborhood, uh, three times. Um, we did five weeks of outreach in January and February, and we had over 1,100 um, comment cards that, in response to supporting the project that we submitted to the Planning Commission. Um, so we have overwhelming support in the community. Uh, that's all I wanted to say today. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Leticia Gaeta, Jolanta Hardini, Jose Gaeta, Good afternoon, Council. My name is Leticia Gaeta, and I'm just here all for it for this new project. Looking forward to it, and that's all. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jose Gaeta, and um, behind the, the plaza, there's a street um, named Columbus Street, and um, it's a very dark street, and a lot of shady people hang around the street uh, for hours, and also it's a dumping ground for trash. Um, I like to see some lighting, street lighting, and also um, they have their gardeners um, do the cleanup. Actually, they leave a lot of trash behind, and also the parking lot. They have um, uh, whatever trash they have in their parking lot gets blown to our uh, residential area because it's a windy um, city, so they could uh, pick up that trash also. Thank you. Thank you. Jolanta Hardini, here, not here? Yes. Martin Hernandez, Dorothy Brock. Pardon me? I am Yolanta Giardini. Okay. You wish to speak? I can just say a few words. No. That um, the shopping center at Mission Hills is really run down, and we will need something you know, new, nicer. So we will welcome uh, that shopping center nicer. Thank you. Thank you. Martin Hernandez, Dorothy Brock. Good afternoon, my name is Martin Hernandez. Um, I'm here to uh, uh, support the uh, project, the Ali project, and when I saw the uh, signs on Zipovera Boulevard inside the uh, shopping center, I got so excited when I saw the uh, signs. So I'm very happy to, to see this project move on. And uh, if I can have all the uh, people who came on the uh, bus with us to stand up, and show how many people are with our project to approve. And I will thank you for your time and also yours. Thank you. Have a good thank day. You. Dorothy Brock, Susan Cristina Casarino, Arturo Snyder. My name is Dorothy Brock, and I've lived in Mission Hills for uh, 60 years. And I just want to say that I'm looking forward to the new shopping center, and uh, it will serve a lot of, save me a lot of driving for my shopping. And my granddaughter's favorite store will be there, Target, so we're looking forward to that. And we thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, City Council. My name is Susan Christina Casarino. I would like to, on behalf of the neighborhood of Mission Hills and the surrounding neighborhoods, uh, we are very excited for this project to move forward. There's been a lot of uh, good, progressive, uh, positive comments regarding this project, and it will revitalize this area. Um, the current mall is pretty much dilapidated, and we look forward to a positive, fresh start in that area. Also, I wanted to mention on behalf of the victims, uh, current and past victims of the church that is there on that spot, we are very, very pleased that that church is going to be torn down because it has been an active crime scene for many years now. And the victims are looking very forward to having that completely demolished and moved out. Um, also, the neighborhoods and the other uh, residents we are all very much happy uh, for the fact that it's going to be a very good resource and very convenient for all of us. And we thank you so much for letting us speak. Thank you. Thank you. Arturo Snyder, Herman, PDQ. Good afternoon, uh, council members. Thank you for your time. Arturo Snyder, CEO of Prime Store Development. I'm uh, very excited to be here in front of you today after what has been about seven or eight years of working very hard uh, with this community. Uh, and putting a project together that has really come together through the vision of the neighborhood. And uh, I really want to also show my appreciation for all the community taking their time and their effort to be here. I know it's a, a very daunting task, and we're very proud of the project. We really have been able to bring forth all of the requests that were brought to us by the community in a project that truly speaks to the neighborhood uh, to be the town center of Mission Hills. 
and also conserve the historic designation of the bowling alley that's there into our continued use. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chair, is this the one dealing with a um, beer and wine for on-site consumption? Item number nine, sir. Does it also have to do with a 24-hour gym? Because really, how long can you work out while you're still halfway dead or asleep at, at night? We don't need a 24-hour gym. We need a respectable timeline for a gym. You know, some of us can lose weight, break down those chipmunk cheeks a little bit. And then there are other of us who say that wine and off-site wine consumption can cause people to get in car accidents. They might be accidentally, not to say that Mr. Weezar wasn't involved in a car accident for 185000 but you should really, really consider what you're doing here. When you add alcohol to a development, you're fucking up the neighborhoods. It's back again from PDQ Publishers of Inglewood. Yeah. We're going to permit the sale and dispensing of beer and wine for on-site consumption. After we're done, then we're going to go right next door to the 24-hour gym with the masseuses and all the pretty ladies, y'all. So that'll be a good way to have a drink exercise and get some additional after hours exercise. This is consistent with the CD7 planned variance that was passed back in the 1980s. That the valley would agree to be the dumping ground for every type of variance possible as long as we leave it out of Beverly Hills, the west side, and of course my home in Sino. So yes, absolutely it has to pass. It must be passed. Mr. Uh, Fuentes, uh, project in your district? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to uh, move approval of the Citywide Planning Commission's recommendations as presented and deny both appeals, please. Okay. If I could have a second. Second by Mr. Harris Dawson. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you. If we could move on to item number four, please. <clears throat> I, item four, Councilman. This is a Planning Commission report. It's recommending uh, amendments to the West Adams, Baldwin Hills, Lamar Park Community Plan and also the associated land use entitlements, the zone change, the high district change, creation of a community plan, implementation overlay district, and amendments to the spe Crenshaw specific plan. Welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Connie Polini Tipton. I'm a senior city planner with the Department of City Planning. And I am very pleased to present the West Adams, Baldwin Hills, Lamert community plan update today. There has been much discussion about community plans and the update program um, in recent months, and for that reason, I'm very pleased to be presenting this third community plan. Uh, last year, we uh, brought to this body the uh, Silmar and the Granada Hills community plans, and those were adopted. So this is our third plan uh, in a decade uh, to bring to you for your consideration. These updates are an important component of the city's monitoring and maintenance of its land use plans. All of these updates allow the plans to integrate the latest thinking in mobility, health, housing, and sustainability policies. One of the major objectives of the plan update has been to create a more user-friendly plan that not only documents a community's vision for the city's evolution, but also lays out an improved implementation tool for that plan. The West Adams plan represents this updated approach to community plans with a new illustrated community plan text filled with illustrative photos and maps, policies and directions for how the community should be improved and quality of life maintained. Along with the revised plan text, zoning has been updated and corrected for the West Adams plan area. 
The existing Crenshaw specific plan has been updated and a new community plan implementation overlay has been created, otherwise known as a CPIO. And these regulations really focus new design regulations and land use regulations on the transit corridors and the transit station areas or nodes as planners like to refer to them. The city's goal to accommodate anticipated growth is met with the West Adams Community Plan. And the plan is also consistent with state and local policies aimed at improving mobility and air quality, moving toward greater sustainability and reducing greenhouse gas emissions with more integrated land use and mobility policies. So two additional points before we present the plan. I'd like to take this moment to acknowledge the many contributors to this plan. And the first person I'd like to recognize is city planner Reuben Caldwell. Without his persistence and dedication and commitment and hard work to this plan and its community members, we would not have a plan for you to update today. Ruben has been instrumental in guiding the community's planning process and also in engaging the community, who I'd also like to acknowledge the sustained involvement and engagement by community members over a period of almost 10 years. Um, in addition, this uh, lengthy process sees a lot of uh, changes in either city leadership, planning management, planning staffing, and I'd like to recognize both, both the past and the present leaderships and, and staffing uh, who have been uh, contributors to this plan process and also have touched and shaped the plan. So we recognize those um, contributors as well as uh, people who help us bring the plan to you for your consideration. So our uh, systems and GIS and graphics staff who allow us to prepare these plans and these zone changes and resolutions for you. Um, in addition, I'd like to acknowledge the city attorney's uh, contributions to our plan process. And um, we recognize that to list everybody by name would be almost an impossible task and we would surely leave someone out, but uh, we make great strides to acknowledge all of these contributors in the plan text acknowledgement section. And we'd um, encourage you to take a look and see just how many people need to uh, come together to make these plans happen. And finally, uh, the last point, since um, we do take quite a bit of time and, and we are thoughtful and thorough in preparing these plans, yet it takes a long time to bring them to you. So it's uh, quite uh, reasonable to expect that there would be some changes over this plan process. So today we will be presenting a few modifications for your consideration and we will ask you to send those to CPC and the mayor for their concurrence and we will return on June 28th uh, with your blessing to uh, approve the plan in its entirety. So with that, I'd like to invite Ruben Caldwell up to explain and uh, present an overview of the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, uh, council committee members. My name is Ruben Caldwell with the Community Planning Bureau. The new community plan before you today represents a comprehensive update to the current West Adams Baldwin Hills Lamert community plan last adopted almost 20 years ago, serving a 13 square mile area of South Los Angeles all the way from the Baldwin Hills to Pico Boulevard. This uh, community plan sets both a long range vision for the area as well as the necessary tools to implement this vision upon adoption. As a quality of life plan, its fundamental goals and policies seek to revitalize the area's commercial and industrial corridors and seize the unparalleled opportunities afforded by not one, but two transit lines featuring a total of 10 stations to serve the area by 2019. Because West Adams encompasses some of the city's most historic neighborhoods, great care has been taken to ensure these changes occur in a manner that is respectful of historic development patterns. The primary outcome being to regenerate complete and sustainable neighborhoods where access to a variety of goods and services, quality jobs and resources are available within walking distance of homes. Through the Community Plan Implementation Overlay District Ordinance, or CPIO, and amendments to the Crenshaw Corridor specific plan, a hierarchy of pedestrian and transit 
oriented development regulations will be activated through adoption of the plan. The new CPIO district in particular, which features seven distinct sub-areas, will regulate the protection of neighborhood scale, enhance the appearance and function of commercial corridors, facilitate compatible medium intensity development at major intersection nodes, and repurpose industrial areas along rail lines to accommodate mixed use and specialized jobs-based TOD. These regulations, along with those of the amended specific plan, in general call for quality new development, better design, and a variety of uses accessible to all and form the crux of this community plan update. Finally, as part of your motion today, we would like the committee to consider the following modifications, which will require referral back to the City Planning Commission and Mayor for their review and determination pursuant to the City Charter and Municipal Code. Once this process is complete, the entire item will be brought back to you for your consideration and final action. The first of these changes pertains to subarea 670 of the change area matrix, located at the northwest corner of Jefferson and La Cienega Boulevards, and often referred to as the Cumulus Project. This project was approved by the City Council on May 25, 2016, and therefore we would ask that you instruct the Planning Department to remove all proposed land use, zoning, and CPIO designations proposed for this site so that the community plan does not eliminate this recent entitlement. Now the next two changes we are introducing on behalf of the Council offices. The first request is regarding subarea 680 of the change area matrix, also within the Jefferson La Cienega TOD and directly across La Cienega Boulevard from the Cumulus site. CD10 would like to retract the proposed R3-1 underlying zoning for those properties currently zoned C2-1 and R4-1 and to change the proposed land use designation from medium residential to community commercial for those parcels not fronting Jefferson Boulevard. All properties would remain the CPIO and the change in designation would ensure zoning consistency as required by state law. Now the third request relates to subarea D of the Crenshaw Corridor specific plan regarding Lemert Park. The request is to limit residential uses south of 43rd Street and not fronting Crenshaw Boulevard to live work only. Commercial and mixed use projects would be allowed throughout the rest of the sub area which spans roughly from King Boulevard to Vernon Avenue. So other necessary changes include updating the land use map and edits to the text and figures of the community plan policy document, all in order to incorporate these, uh, these noted modifications, as well as add clarifying language to several sections regarding the jurisdictional limits of the community plan and to address minor typographical errors and corrections. And lastly, I'd like to thank the many community residents, stakeholders, neighborhood council members, council offices, department and agency staff and representatives for their continued patience and support in developing and bringing this plan to completion. Thank you. Thank you. With that, um, we will go to public comment. Greg Brown. Carl Eric Morgan, Gwendolyn Flynn, welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Greg Brown, and I'm here on behalf of the NRDC and our thousands of members and activists who live in LA in support of the West Adams Neighborhood Plan. Though we recognize that the Neighborhood Plan can't solve all the challenges we face as a dynamic, expanding city, we are encouraged that the plan focuses on the future. A future with sustainable communities which support the health of LA citizens with walkable neighborhoods, pedestrian friendly storefronts, parks, and open, spatial, open spaces for recreation. We are similarly supportive of the emphasis on alternative transportation, encouraging mobility by biking, walking, and public transit. Finally, we are encouraged that the policies begin to address threats to our communities posed by urban oil and gas exploration. Though we would prefer to see stronger regulations for protecting the community health from urban oil and gas exploration, stronger provisions preventing displacement, and a clear strategy for protecting open space in light of future development, overall, the West Adams Neighborhood Plan marks a step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carl Eric Morgan, uh, the Empowerment Congress West Area Neighborhood Development Council Planning and Land Use Chair. 
On April 6, 2013, we voted unanimously to approve the exemption of CD10 from the policy to restrict the development of new standalone fast food restaurants within a half mile radius of an existing fast food restaurant. Uh, thankfully, these changes, as well as many others, are implemented by the current version of the plan. We also respectfully request the following changes. Uh, restrict the marijuana dispensaries. Marijuana, no marijuana dispensaries should be located within a half mile of another dispensary. Also, they should not be located near a place of worship, school, or residential zone by at least 1,000 feet. In addition, a second uh, change, clarification of the definition of auto-related uses to include car washes, also defined by the LA Municipal Code as car laundry and wash racks, uh, and prohibit the use in the Crenshaw Quarter specific plan. Oh, Thank you. Gwendolyn Flynn, not here. Sadhu Woods, Romero Malvo, Damian Goodman. Welcome. Good afternoon, committee members. I'm Sadia Woods. I represent community health councils here. And um, my comments, um, number one, we're concerned about housing provisions in the plan, specifically in chapter three under multifamily residential that addresses condominium conversions. Uh, we would like to see stronger language that protects current families who are living in the plan area from displacement um, and allows folks who want to continue living in that area to be able to afford homes um, that are within their income range. Uh, we'd like to commend Reuben Caldwell and the rest of the planning team for listening and capturing our vision for the place that we live, but we do want to just comment on the public process for the update of this plan, given the numerous changes, suggested modifications, and the very technical nature of community planning, we respectfully request an extension of public comment time limits where community plans are concerned. 60, sec 60 seconds is not enough time for most people to offer substantive comments on plans of this magnitude. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Romero Malvo. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I wish to comment and support the, uh, the plan, except in two instances. On the southwest corner of Crenshaw and Rodeo, the plan is to upzone to Height District 2. This is directly in front of a single family neighborhood. Unlike what is on the other side of the street, there, the other side of the street has a whole row of low density apartments before it gets to the single family neighborhood. That's not the case on the southeast corner. In addition to that, there's the cumulative effect that all four corners would be upzoned. The only street that would be receiving the, the result of this increase would be Rodale. These are single family neighborhoods. It's, a, it's historic and we ask for their protection. In addition, there is the upzoning of Rodale and Arlington. Again, on all sides of that, that's a single family neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Damien Goodman, Brad Rosenheim. Damien Goodman of the Crenshaw Subway Coalition had a whole set of comments and then Ruben threw cumulus into the conversation. Where the plan doesn't accommodate a 29-story luxury housing unit at La Cienega and Jefferson, just change the plan to adopt it. You have a problem. I'm going to be very transparent. We've already retained services of legal counsel to sue you on cumulus. We will win. You include this within this ERI process, we will have to take on the ERR as well. So as good natured as I like to see many of these changes to this Crenshaw specific plan, to the West Adams Community Plan, we are clearly opposed to cumulus. So you've got several actions, you can do several things. You can rescind your decision on cumulus and avoid the headache, or you can take on not just one lawsuit against cumulus, but a second lawsuit against this EIR. I submit the rest of the comments for the record, but. I can't accent enough the need for greater community conversation given the length of this process. You're doing this on election day. Uh, I would have rather see this, this form taken back to the community and have this be a much longer conversation than it is here today. Thank you. Thank you. PDQ, Herman, and our final speaker is Jordan Barrowkim. Yes, the debate is over. 
the motion is passed. It's too late. The motion is already passed. So cumulus, cumulus is what we got to have a 140 story tower of Babel. So the next earthquake could pour it down. Jesus wrote about the cumulus project in the Bible, and now it's going to come to fruition. LA's Tower of Babel, and that's why we got to have this Tower of Babel environmental quality report to complete the Tower of Babel. Because nobody going to be in there, $15 an hour minimum wage and no money. How are you going to pay people to work without money? Nobody got no money. Look at that, empty pocket. The only thing I got is a goddamn key to a car to drive the hell out of here. Thank you. Gracious be. Another building not made for you and me. It's absolutely ridiculous when you find that Crenshaw Quarter specific plan doesn't relate to you or me, Mr. Dawson, because of the color we represent. Us poverty people know what it's like to live in poverty. Medicare, Medicare. Back in my days, it was called welfare, brother. Welfare. And I just want to remind the world about Babel, that the land use amendments... Mr. Herman, to the, uh, I'm reading the agenda. Time, please. You've got to stay on the subject matter before us on the agenda. Thank you. Well, sir, I, I believe I was trying to engage in this conversation on, on, this, on this paragraph. You have this long paragraph. Plan framework to the West Adams, Belvin Hills, Limerick Community Plan. So then you go back over here and it says, oh, God, for God's sake, and the Culver City, city to the west, as well as the city of Inglewood and unincorporated Los Angeles County to the south, to the south, to the south. Jordan Barrowkin. Good afternoon, committee members. Jordan Barrowkin from Council President Weston's office. Uh, we'd like to thank the planning department for uh, their diligence on updating the plan. They uh, dedicated nearly a decade of service to updating this plan and to all the community members and residents who helped uh, mold the plan to what it is today. Uh, the planning department already touched on a few changes. Uh, I'd just like to speak a few more changes to the record and then submit to the clerks. Uh, we'd like to instruct the Department of City Planning to merge the westerly portion of sub-area 1940, also denoted as, uh, also denoted as a portion of sub-area A, into sub-area 1942, also denoted as sub-area F, to the proposed West Adams Plan CPIO Jefferson La Cienega T uh, TOD. Uh, next, we'd like to ask that for the Crenshaw Corridor specific plan for sub-area D, uh, that we ask that parking, re parking requirements remain the same uh, for change of use projects so long as building footprints, so long as foot, uh, building footprints are uh, remaining the same. Uh, we'd also like to instruct the Department of City Planning with the assistance of Council District 10 and South Robertson Neighborhood Council to report back on incorporating changes to the West Adams plan that would allow deeper commercial lots along South Robertson Boulevard, in, including giving proper setbacks, allowing developers to acquire and annex the R2-1 lots, including the alleyway that directly abuts the commercial corridor. Uh, we also like to instruct Department of City Planning with the assistance of Council District 10 and South Robertson Neighborhood Council to report back on rezoning National Boulevard between Venice and Robertson to shift towards mixed-use residential developments, completing the high-density residential currently under construction in Culver City. For similar reasons, include options to rezone Robertson Boulevard south of Cataragas to accommodate high-density residential over neighborhood-oriented commercial exceeding the current three-story limit. And lastly, we'd like to amend the Crenshaw Corridor specific plan to revise Map 6, sub-area A, and indicate a 75-foot minimum setback as highlighted on the map in lieu of the currently proposed 100-foot minimum setback. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, Planning Department, um, have you had a chance to review these additional 
modifications to the plan and any conflicts, any uh, thing that stands up? Uh, yes, we, we have, and we do need uh, some clarification on a couple of the items. Okay. So the, the first item would be the um, change in sub-area 1940 and 1942 of the change area matrix, and this also regards sub-area or parcel groups A and F of the Jefferson La Cienega TOD. We'd just like to clarify that these are future changes or are they intended to be uh, brought back to CPC with the other changes? Okay, I was just handed something that says number 4A that's uh, in addition to, so do you need clarification on, on that? Can we have a CD10 up here please? I just want to, um, Right, no, I apologize for not being clear yet. Uh, this would be uh, taking place post adoption. So we want to just make the instruction now, still go ahead and move forward with the plan, but I uh, just wanted to begin the conversation today. But it would be a, a uh, instruction post adoption. Is that appropriate, planning department? Can you do that with enough? Um, yes, we, we feel that is appropriate and, and that was our understanding as well. Oh, okay. Good. That's 4A, right? And, yes. And, okay. And we, we would also like to clarify that the uh, changes for the uh, Robertson Boulevard area are also future changes. Is that uh, clear on your recommendation, um, CD10? No, I apologize again. That, that, that was something raised by the South Robertson Neighborhood Council kind of late in the game. And so again, this would be another request uh, that we would instruct Department of City Planning to work on, again, post-adoption. And so, uh, so, so, ba so basically there are two additional changes that we uh, will note moving forward with this motion in addition to the live work modification for the Mert Park Village, the change to sub area 680 and the change to sub area 670. And those would be the, um, the exemption of uh, off street parking for change of uses in sub area D of the Mert Park Village as well as the a uh, reduction of the setback of height, um, uh, I'm sorry, reduction of the setback of 100 foot for anything above 70, I'm sorry, 60 feet in sub area A to 75 feet. Those would be the, uh, the additional two modifications. Okay. And if you, uh, we can certainly take a stab at any motion or if, you, if you'd like to clarify what's in the motion further, I, we can. Yes, we have um, some questions by the city attorney, please. Terry Kaufman, Messia City Attorney's Office. So there's a motion um, that is to be introduced that discusses what you um, should be voting on and um, you can have staff read that into the record. Sure. Summarize it uh -huh. so it would be part of your action. Yes, okay. and, and, you know, and we certainly have the, the motion fully prepared and, re and writing and we would uh, like to and just in reference this motion in writing as much as we can to, to move through the language. It um, is quite lengthy because it, because it has two subsections. But the, uh, the first subsection would read, we move that pursuant to city charter section 555 in Los Angeles Municipal Code section 11.5F, the following modifications to the West Adams Baldwin, um, Baldwin Hills Lamert Community Plan update shall, shall occur. And well, that one second, be, please. And yes. these, these are in addition to the ones proposed by CD10? No, this, this would be the, the full motion. This so, would be and, the whole motion that incorporates yeah. the CD10 Correct. recommendations. Okay. Correct. And as I say, I will try to paraphrase as much as I can and, okay. and just include by reference. Okay. So, so for, for uh, sub area uh, 670, change the proposed land use designation so that it's consistent with the resolution adopting the case for the cumulus project. For uh, sub area 680, change the proposed land use designations uh, to uh, community commercial from uh, medium residential uh, for changes recommended by staff um, uh, in terms of minor, clear, um, minor correction of errors to the community plan policy document and exhibits 
And this is also, uh, these changes are outlined in an exhibit of this motion, exhibit one. Um, the second part of the motion would, would further um, would further move that pursuant to city charter 558 and 559 as well as uh, municipal code sections 1157, 1232 that we would uh, uh, resend the, uh, the zoning for proposed zoning for uh, sub area 670 as well as uh, 680 for those properties currently zoned C2-1 and R4-1 uh, for sub area D of course uh, which is uh, change area matrix sub area 1360 that uh, would limit residential use to live work only and for sub area D also um, known as sub area 1360 no additional parking shall be required for any change of use within a building existing as of the adoption date of the ordinance and then for sub area A uh, to reduce the proposed 100 foot setback height above 60 feet as indicated on map six of the amended specific plan to a 70 foot 75 foot setback and that concludes that the motion okay so we would um, the motion if we were to move forward would include the approval of the um, ordinance uh, before us with the amendments as proposed by the planning department that incorporates the amendments by CD 10 and approve the GPA amendments and we need to send this to CPC for re reconsideration. So Terry Kaufman, Messia City Attorney's Office. So this is that issue that has come up before where modifications, if this body um, wants to make modifications to the general plan amendment, that those modifications have to go back to CPC and the mayor for recommendation and then it comes forward. And then there are some changes to the other legislative items that have to go to CPC or could be could be handled by a director sign up, but they have to determine that. Okay. Thank you. So for those items as determined by the city attorney and plan department that need to go back to the CPC, we'll do that. Um, procedurally, do we keep the rest of it here? Or are we sending it all back? We're keeping we're keeping the rest of it here, right? Okay. So we'll continue. Uh, the remainder of the portion, those new items as identified will send back to uh, the CPC for reconsideration and uh, we will hear the item here once we get it all back. Okay. So with no objection, that will be the order. Thank you. Thank you very much. Item number seven. <clears throat> item seven, Councilman, this is a nuisance abatement case relative to the operation of the 108 motel in CD8 and there's the an appeal filed by Mr. Shaw who's the uh, property owner. Thank you. Um, the appeal was filed by who Mr. Mr. SHAA. I don't have a card for Mr. Shaw who filed the appeal. Mr. Shaw, are you here? Yes. You need to fill out a card. Um, after I didn't, did I just give the hearing and send? Okay, we're going to uh, uh, first hear from the staff here first, please, and then we'll we need to uh, we'll call you up, Mr. Shaw. If you submitted a card, please clarify that with the city clerk. Let me call staff up, please. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Uh, committee. Alita James, um, Associate Zoning Administrator for the uh, Office of Zoning Administrator, Office of Zoning Administration um, Condition Compliance Unit, Nuisance Abatement Revocations. I'd like to give the uh, committee a brief, brief background on the project and its location prior to uh, calling out the um, conditions that the appellant is appealing today. On February uh, 2nd, 2015, the planning department opened a nuisance abatement revocation case for the business operation known as the 108 Motel, 
located at 10721 South Broadway in response to a community allegations and the LA Police Department call and arrest reports for a time period of April 17th, 2011 to June 5th, 2014, including documentation of criminal homicide, rape by force, prostitution, loitering for prostitution, keeping a disorderly house, assault with a deadly weapon, battery, kidnapping, burglary, robbery, theft, vandalism, and noise disturbance. A notice of public hearing went out to the property owner, Ascar Global Investments Corp, noting they have the same mailing address as the 108 motel. The purpose of the hearing was to obtain testimony from the owner and operator of the subject facility and from any other affected or interested parties regarding the operation of the motel in order to determine whether the use constituted a public nuisance or whether conditions should be imposed on the operation. The director of planning has the authority under section 12.27.1 of the Los Angeles Municipal Code uh, to impose conditions on the operation of the existing business in order to mitigate any land use impacts caused by the operation of such use. The hearing was set for Tuesday, May 12, 2015 at 10 o'clock here in City Hall. The City of Los Angeles was the applicant. In attendance was Officer Michael Dickus, Sergeant Hargerty, Hargerty of the Los Angeles Police Department, the current manager of the motel, Amit Kumar Shah, and representative from Council District 8. The Zemus Profile uh, Report lists the property ownership under the same name, SR Global Investment Corp, care of N N Nilish P. Solaski. excuse me. The last change of ownership for the property was um, February 6, 2007. The property uh, manager, Amit Kumar Shah, testified at the public hearing that the owner of the property, Nalish Salaski, is his brother, whom resides in Houston, Texas. At the hearing, the planning staff testified as to the physical conditions of the site as they observed during a site visit when accompanied by LA police, police uh, officer between the hours of 12 and 1 p.m. on February 5th, 2015. The current property has a certificate of occupancy for a one-story motel with 20 guest rooms, one manager's unit apartment, one office and 11 on-site parking spaces. The property is zoned for commercial use. The Los Angeles Police Department provided testimony at this hearing indicating that the site had been a problematic motel since 2001, and in 2013, the case was referred to the Citywide Nuisance Abatement Program, otherwise known as CNAP. The Los Angeles Police Department also documented nine arrests and investigation reports occurring on, at the site location between April 17, 2011 through June 5, 2014. In addition, they provided consolidated crime analysis data reports indicating nine crimes of arrest charges ranging from the period of time from October 22, 2012 through October 22, 2014. In addition, there was 30 calls for service that were submitted for the property location between the period of time of September 22, 2011 through January 17, 2014. The calls also, um, excuse me, in addition, there were 50 calls for service for the intersection of Broadway and 108th Street seven of which were directly related to the 108 motel, which included trespassing, lewd conduct, domestic dispute, battery, and child found. Based upon the testimony given by the planning staff, Los Angeles Police Department, and the property manager, manager the zoning administrator pursuant to section 12271 of the municipal code required the modification of the operation of the business known as the 108 motel in order to mitigate these adverse impacts caused by the said operation. The zone administrator imposed 35 operating conditions. Today, the appellant, also the, known as the prop, property manager, is appealing the following conditions. And in summary, it was condition number nine, which uh, refers to no short time rentals. Condition number 19, requiring that the um, operator provide at least one private security guard on duty 24 hours, seven days a week then the security guard shall be certified by the State Department Bureau of Consumer Affairs, Bureau of Security and Investigative Services. 
The applicant, the appellant, excuse me, is also appealing condition number 27, requiring that there be no sale or giveaway of condoms unless directed to do so by a governmental agency. And fourthly, the, the appellant is appealing condition number 32. The property owner is required per condition 32 to complete a property management training program approved by the housing department and a copy of that certificate of attendance shall be submitted to the Department of City Planning Condition Compliance Unit, Nuisance Abatement and Revocation Section. There have been findings made to support these conditions imposed on the operation of the motel. Condition number nine, again, dealing with the no short time rentals, is designed to prevent the, the no short time stay and thereby prohibit the rental of rooms for the purpose of prostitution or other illicit criminal activity. Condition number 19, which deals again with the um, requiring a private licensed security guard 24 hours, seven days a week, is designed to provide on-site security and protection 24 hours per day, seven days a week for all persons associated with the property. This condition is vital to the safety of the persons associated with the property as evident of, that the property manager himself testified during the public hearing as to have been assaulted on the property as he is tempted to stop a couple from using um, one of the rooms for the purpose of prostitution. Condition number 27, which refers to the sale, no sale or giveaway of condoms, is designed to prohibit the distribution of these items which are contributory to enhancing the experience of prostitution and the potential for possibly escalating such criminal activity. And finally, condition number 32, which deals with the uh, property management training as approved by the housing department, is appropriate measure to assure that all persons responsible for the motel operation are trained in response and responsible uh, property managers, which can assist in reducing potential criminal activity on the site. The zoning administrator has also required the property owner operator to file a plan approval application within five to six months of the effective date of this determination. This will allow the property operator to clean up the nuisance activities and permit the zoning administrator to maintain a close watch on the operation of the premises. A compliance review is also a requirement of the municipal code provisions regarding or re regulating the abatement procedures pursuant to 12.271 of the LA Municipal Code. All conditions imposed have been resulted in the desired effect of reducing or eliminating the nuisance activities associated with the current use. Therefore, the director of planning respectfully requests that the appeal be denied and the zoning administrator's decision be upheld. I'm available for any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from, um, well, actually, let me ask our officers if they wish to speak before the appellant. Uh, Officer Michael Dix and Dana Harris uh, from the LAPD. You wish to speak now or, or, or after the appellant? Okay. I'll be short in my comments. Sure. Good afternoon. I'm Detective Dana Harris from the Los Angeles Police Department. I am the officer in charge of the citywide nuisance abatement unit. A uh, little bit of history about our unit. Our, our mission is to investigate any ongoing nuisance activity involving unreasonable, unwarranted, or unlawful acts allowed by the property or business owner who is unwilling or unable to voluntarily cooperate in solving this problem. A part of my responsibility is to ensure that all of our investigators assigned to the new citywide nuisance abatement unit form a partnership with both the business and the property owners and with the community. Our job is to mitigate any nuisance activity attributed to the business and or the property owner and deal with them in a fair and impartial manner. The 108 Motel has been a comprehensive and extensive investigation involving the Los Angeles Police Department, the Department of Building and Safety, and uh, zoning. This has been an ongoing abatement. In that time, there have been numerous calls for service at this location, and I'm especially concerned about the calls involving the child neglect, the child abuse, the lewd conduct, the domestic violence, and the increasing crimes of violence. I have been to this establishment myself and have witnessed for myself the steady stream of prostitutes who have been brought back from the Figueroa Corridor and are going to the, lot, to the 108 Motel and completing their transactions. I have reviewed this particular file and on numerous occasions I have, I have uh, observed Officer Dickus 
make contact with the property owner, meet and confer, and offer solutions to help mitigate this problem and help solve this problem. And it is obvious from my 28 years of service that this property owner is unwilling or unable to cooperate. It is a privilege to own and operate a business in the city of Los Angeles. And again, I believe this uh, property owner is unwilling to comply with these orders. Thank you. Thank you. Officer Michael Dix. Good afternoon, Honorable Council Members. I'm uh, Officer Michael Dickus. I work Detective Support and Vice Division, handling uh, citywide nuisance abatement uh, in South Los Angeles. Um, I'm not going to reiterate much of what's already been said today. I know we've had a long uh, meeting here. So um, one of the things I did want to touch base upon is uh, what my supervisor had said. I've met with this applicant back in uh, February of 2015, provided him training, provided him suggested operating conditions. Um, I also provided him crime stats and trends in regards to uh, that particular area, which is very close to the Figueroa corridor. Um, what troubles me is that none of my suggestions that have been adhered to, and we're here today um, going through this particular hearing. Um, what I did want to touch base on, and, and most importantly, is the uh, determination letter was out of uh, March 25th, 2016, and the applicant appealed it as of April. We did four separate undercover operations at this, mo at this motel, uh, receiving violations each time we were there for renting a room for prostitution. Um, this is clearly a, a blatant disregard for public safety. Um, the applicant will probably come up here and tell you um, what he's told me in the past, that, you know, I'm aware that there's prostitutes in my property. What can I do about it? We've, been, we've covered that. So we're here now to basically tell him that the city is going to tell you what to do with your property. Um, I'm going to close really quick. Uh, we, we've done some of our own investigations, my partner and I, because we are involved with the Figueroa Corridor Project. <clears throat> and I have a dozen or better arrest reports um, basically from prostitutes who were picked up by undercover police officers directing them to the 108 motel. And in some of these reports, the prostitutes had even said the operator rents the room by the hour, which he will come up here and tell you he does. That's one of the conditions he's trying to appeal. Um, he will, the prostitutes have told him that they don't document any information at the 108 motel, which is entirely true. In our undercover operations, the um, undercover operator will go up to the room, present his ID, the operator will take the ID, attach it to a blank registration card, and when the officer returns to retrieve his IT, ID, the registration card is, in essence, blank. So. This is uh, another caveat of investigation that we're going to be going and working on as we proceed forward. But in my professional opinion, um, I really think that the use of this location should be revoked. Um, in the 13 years I've been handling nuisance abatement investigations, this is the rare instance when an operator has been presented with A, a zoning hearing, and B, appealing it to the plum and still operating in the same manner and fashion that he has done since I met him back in 2015. So that will be it for my testimony. If you have any questions for me, I will remain, and uh, you guys can call me back up if necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Shaw, appellant. Okay, you have uh, five minutes, sir. Good afternoon, council member. My name is Amit Kumar Shaw. I am the owner's brother who is now operating 108 Motel. This motel was leased till 2014, June, and it was operated by someone else. When I take the charge over in the July, I see that so many things are going wrong. So we have already think, clear up everything, and we start making the good business with the uh, weekly and the daily basis. But our motel is in the neighborhood of 80% people are homeless, which cannot afford the $65 a day. If you go and check 384 motels around this area, you can check, go any motel, everybody is doing the same practice because they cannot afford to pay $65 a day. So they need to pay some money for the short time to take the rest and take the shower. So they come to pay $20 for two, three hours and they stay and they take rest and they take the shower, which they can afford it. 
That's why we are renting short-term rental. I have only 20 rooms motel in that area. 384 motels are there. All, every motel is having the same problem. Why they are going behind my motels only? I don't understand the things. Because that motel was previously owned by someone else and now I'm, I'm the operator owner. Now they are giving me the hard time for the same thing. When I filed the appeal, I said I'm, I'm defending for the short-term rental. Then also they come to my property and they start doing the same things. Because decision is still pending that I cannot run short-term rental or no. Then also they push me that you cannot rent the short term. They, you cannot rent the short term. They are forcing me the law which is not good for me. That's why I filed the appeal. I filed all the explanation, everything. You can go around these things. And I, I don't think I did anything wrong for the short term rentals. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor E.L. E. Williams. Williams. Thank you. Welcome. Teresa Godinez, Carlos Leon. Good afternoon. Thank you, board members. I am here on behalf of the Broadway Community Corridor and the church I serve, which has a 60 plus year rich history. As a matter of fact, our church, the New Prospect Baptist Church, is less than four football fields away from this location. Along with me and a portion of the membership of our community, uh, please stand, we are in favor of city improvement and development in our community. We therefore petition to you, the board, to sustain your action on this matter. It is important to our community. Thank you. Teresa Godinez, Carlos Leon, Fernando Montes Rodriguez. Good afternoon. My name is Teresa Godinez. Uh, I am a concerned resident. I live on Broadway and 92nd Street for 35 years. I am a mother of a 13-year-old girl who is con concerned about how things have gone from bad to worse, like marijuana shops, liquor stores, and lots of motels who bring uh, prostitution. I ask to keep the restrictions on motels and oppose the appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, hello council members. Thank you for your time. I'm standing here as a young man who grew up in South LA and very aware of the poor conditions that we're constantly surrounded by. Uh, liquor stores, plenty of marijuana dispensaries, and more than enough motels uh, doing what we've just been hearing over this last few minutes. Uh, plenty of abuse, violence, sex trafficking. I am currently an organizer at Community Coalition where we meet monthly with members in Vermont Vista who reside around that motel and I've heard plenty of times how they are fed up and tired of the negative effects this motel has had in our community and our lives. So I am asking you today to please oppose the appeal to keep the conditions and to continue to look out for every single Angelino, especially those that are most affected by these types of nuisances, nuisances and it's been happening for way too long. Thank you. Thank you. Fernando Montes Rodriguez. Gone. PDQ and Herman. Uh, yes. A personal topic, yes. So what happens? You're running a legitimate business. The cops got to be paid and they didn't get paid. I know. They didn't get paid. So now we got prostitution. Now we have loitering. And this poor guy, Amit Kumar Shah from India. These are Hindus. These are not, these are brothers. They're trying to run a legitimate business, paying taxes. People working. People renting rooms for $65 a day. Not your $445 a month a day rentals. These are poor people that need housing. 
The Honorable Gil Cedillo says we need a thousand units of housing. We already got a hundred here. Sustain and keep this place alive. We must sustain. Come on, folks. We must sustain. That's a nice camera on your hand, Mr. Chipmunk. But let's stay on topic here. We need these housings for people who are poor, families that are homeless, our veterans that are so fucked up and homeless, Mr. Dawson. But we don't care about veterans and their families that are living on the street. Nor do we care about our citizens, those here illegally that need homes. But that Hillary Clinton woman said, oh, I'm doing everything for immigration reform. Oh, fuck you, Hillary. Fuck you, Hillary Clinton. Sir, this because is the about... Democ uh, the democracy says uh, housing is for Herman, everyone. Herman, I am going to ask you one more time. You've been warned that if you're going to speak on an item, stick to the agenda. We give you some leeway because obviously everything's connected. But when you start venturing off into other things, we're going to ask you to stop and to leave. Thank you. Okay, sir. Well, well thank you for playing with my mind, but... Now, now, now I'm confused. What item are we on, sir? Mr. What Chair, item are we on? This will be Mr. Herman's third warning, and I think that it would be a Oh, so now you're threatening me on. now, right, Mr. Chipmunk? You're threatening me? you threatening me. Take my time away. Thank you. Uh, Herman, you are now asked to leave these chambers, and uh, you have been warned before. You know the rules. And for those listening for the first time at these meetings, um, because of the First Amendment... Mr. Mr. Chair, it should be noted for the record that Mr. Herman continues to disrupt the meeting on his way out. Um, so for those of you for the first time at these meetings, um, the people who do public comment speaking have a lot of leeway in expressing themselves as they wish. They could cuss, they could express themselves as they wish so long as they stick to the item on the agenda. Uh, it's been, yes, it's been tested in courts. Um, and in this instance, uh, I want to just uh, mark for the record that even as Mr. Herman was leaving, he was disrupting the meeting uh, for future reference if we were to ask him to be banned from these meetings. Thank you. So, Mr. Harris Dawson, this is in your district. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I'd uh, just uh, very shortly comment uh, to thank the Zoning Administration for their thorough work as well as the uh, citywide nuisance abatement program and our, our officers. And uh, we have folks uh, here from um, New Prospect, uh, Mr. Henry Baptist. I want you to know, Reverend Williams, uh, you might have a new member. Mr. Herman stood up when you asked for the members to stand up, so you should go get some tithe from him, uh, um, as well as the community coalition uh, members as well. Uh, the, this Broadway corridor uh, has been challenged for decades, going back to the early 1980s. And, uh, a lot of times we have operators that um, come in and either can't handle the business or are unwilling to handle the business. And so uh, this is a, a situation where the city has to step in and, and help manage the property. And so I ask my colleagues uh, to strongly uh, support the zoning administrator and reject the appeal. Second. So uh, it's been moved and seconded to... Uh, deny uh, the appeal, correct? Deny the appeal. De deny the appeal, okay. And um, with that, we'll uh, uh, just let me state that uh, for me sitting on this uh, committee for nearly 10 years and for having an officer that I've seen here before, Officer Dick has come in and I've seen him testify in these matters. For him to testify that he uh, is this one of the worst uh, operators you've seen when even after they're going through hearing processes and the premises continue to be operated in the same manner. At least oftentimes people attempt to clean up a little, even if uh, they're having difficulty. This is abhorrent and we want to ensure that uh, the message is sent loud and clear that if uh, places are going to be operated like this, that um, our city will do whatever it can to clean up the nuisance for the local neighborhood. So thank you. Um, any objections to denying the appeal? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you. Item number two. Yes, sir. Item two is this is a city planning commission recommended 
proposed ordinance uh, to repeal sections of the Muni Code um, and to comply with state law uh, AB 1886 relative to second dwelling units. Welcome. Good afternoon, Council Members. Claire Bowen, Department of City Planning. In 2002, the state of California enacted AB 1866 as a means of promoting a ministerial process to facilitate the development of second units as an important source of housing. In adopting 1866, the legislature declared that second units are a valuable form of housing in California. Second units provide housing for family members, students, the elderly, in-home health care providers, the disabled, and others at often below market prices within existing neighborhoods. Homeowners who create second units benefit from added income and an increased sense of security. The city, too, is on record for supporting and encouraging the development of second units. The recent housing element adopted in December of 2013 is aligned with the state's second unit standards and has a number of stated policies that encourage the provision of additional rental housing and making ownership of those lots more affordable. Second dwelling units, often referred to as granny flats, can help homeowners make ends meet while providing affordable housing opportunities for single young people, seniors, and multi-generational families, families by providing a mix of housing that responds to changing family needs and smaller households. Second units can also provide housing benefits without significantly changing the basic character of established neighborhoods and allow for a more efficient use of housing stock and infrastructure. Of the 482 cities in California, at least 90% of them utilize the provisions set forth in AB 1866 as a means of enabling the development of second dwelling, un dwelling units. Approximately only 20 to 50 cities in the state have tailored local standards to support the development of second units but with, and allow for a focus on good design. Nationally, local ordinances have focused on reducing barriers to the development of second units while preserving neighborhood character. Over the past 10 years, 555 second units have received certificates of occupancy in the city. The approximately average size of these units was 763 square feet. These units, in addition to needing to meet the requirements of the state, were also subject to all of the parking, setback, passageway, and height limitations governed by the city's zoning code. There are approximately, or there are right now, currently 379 projects that are in plan check and another 368 projects um, that have been delayed due to the recent court decision. While the development of second units has been relatively modest, the number of illegal second units has proliferated. Researchers at UCLA estimate that, the, estimate that there are between 30 to 50,000 illegal second units in the city. These illegal units are typically built without the additional parking space that AB 1866 requires, but have also ignored many of the zoning requirements. Oftentimes, these illegal, illegal units result from the conversion of existing garages, recreation rooms, or pool houses that have much less stringent setback requirements. Despite the modest number of legal second units, and in recognition of the many, many illegal units that have been constructed, the department understands the interests of community groups in having second unit standards that are tailored to their specific community. To address community concerns of building scale and height, not just of second units, but of the overall building envelope, the department's code studies group is currently working on new tailored building envelope standards that would apply to each of the 25 communities that are or soon to be subject to the interim control ordinance. These new building envelope standards would identify setback and height limitations for a variety of communities, including multiple hillside areas. These standards would ensure that any building, whether it was the primary home, a second unit, a garage, or recreation room, would be required to be built within the shape and size of the prescribed building envelope. While these standards would initially be limited to the 25 ICO communities, these new envelope standards will be applied to each community in the city during the um, update of each, of each community plan. This approach would allow the city to permit the continued development of second units using the same state standards that the city has relied on since 2006, while also facilitating the development of additional building envelope standards to be tailored to our many various communities. I'd like to all let you know that Ken Gill from the Los Angeles Department of City Planning, of Department of Building and Safety, and Stephen Blau from the Office of City Attorney are also here with us today, should you have any questions following the testimony. Thank you. So we'll go to public comment now. Ira Belgrade, Mary Harrison, Len Judikin.
Ira Belgrade, we must repeal the outdated granny flat ordinance in favor of AB 1866 until we can craft a better ordinance. Last night, I read letters to the Plum Committee containing all of these nonsense, negative comments and threats to the city by none other than all of the... Now, I'm sorry, but I'm going to use the N-word here. All the NIMBYs. All the not-in-my-backyard people professing virtual Armageddon if you repeal the old ordinance. Yet these people haven't seemed to notice that AB 1866 has been the de facto law in our city for the past six years, and in all of that time, there's never been a single issue. There's an estimated 50,000 unpermitted units in Los Angeles. That's a lot of potential additional housing units that could be made legal with the right ordinance. We are the Yimbies. Yes, in my backyard, I want my ADU. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Harrison, thank you, council members. Um, I urge you to approve the ordinance before you to repeal the existing second dwelling unit regulations. I have an approved second unit plan with a ready to issue permit from the LADBS, which was issued in the fall of 2015 and for which we cannot now get a construction permit. The SDU is designed as the only affordable means for me to move closer to a loved one who owns a home in the Mar Vista neighborhood. This emergency is real. Homeowners such as ourselves are caught in limbo after relying on the LADBS and the city and paying the city good money. It is unconscionable to change the rules after the fact. I would also note that, uh, as has been mentioned, that the existing city codes supply numerous uh, protections for neighborhoods. Uh, our project, thank you. Thank you. This was uh, Mary Harrison, correct? You're, yeah, okay. Mary Harrison, Len Judiken, Armin Muradian, Garen Frizian. <clears throat> thank you. My name is Len Judiken. I'm in my mid 80s. For health and safety reasons, the family felt that I should live as close to my son as possible. As a result, we applied for and received a permit for a second unit. I also have limited time left <coughs> excuse me, on this earth, and I would therefore love to have been as close to my grandchildren as possible. Our permit was issued. It is the only permit that has so far been revoked. I wish you people to proceed as uh, projected so that you grandfather all these units and that my uh, permit gets reinstated. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hey there, uh, our memoradian. I got my permits uh, six months ago. Uh, did uh, 1,200 square footing. Uh, this is my fourth time here. I think Steve knows me already. If you want to retire to ZA120, change it to 680 square foot. I'm sure they'll run, you know. Uh, I support Garcetti. This is frustrating. I get a call that I could start fixing my house. I can't fix my house. I changed my mind. I want 300000 for my garage. I got a nice garage. Persian rug, Italian chandelier, you know. So, I don't want to fix my house anymore. I spent several hundreds of thousand dollars, and my mom's health's not good as well, so. Hello, uh, Garen Papazian. I also support the proposed ordinance. I personally have invested time and money, all this in order to receive a permit that is not good anymore. I did all this because I relied on the city's secondary dwelling unit policy that was in effect at the time. The people that are behind me also relied on the city's second dwelling unit policy that was in effect at the time. Uh, we all can be classified as the city's smallest builder, and my story is only one of many. You'll see a lot of stories here of hardship, financial and emotional. Uh, we did all of this because we decided to do the right thing. 
Instead of illegally converting a garage or and exposing a potential family member or a tenant to an unsafe living environment or a neighborhood to an overcrowded parking situation, we decided to invest money and pay city fees and taxes to create additional housing the right way. We relied on the city's SDU policy in effect. I encourage you to adopt the new proposed ordinance in an expedited way, please. Thank you. Bill Hankins, Robert Maher Hanian, Donna Ron Bender. Ready. Welcome. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Hankins. Um, I'm for the uh, second unit dwellings. Um, my thing is, it's, it's a no brainer. Okay, the state of California has a second unit dwelling law. Okay, even the judge's order was clear. They said if you can't get it right, repeal it and use the state default uh, guidelines. I'm one of many people who have spent millions of dollars building these second unit dwellings and I can't get a permit now. I can't get a certificate of occupancy. I can't sell the properties. I can't rent them out. I urge you guys to follow the judge's order, follow the rules, Adopt the second unit dwelling law as it is, repeal the old order, because it doesn't work. Welcome. Hi, my name is Robert Mahanian. Over the past three years, I've spent over $300,000 in flattening my north of Sunset Brentwood lot to a usable square footage of about 8,000 square feet. Now, I have a great flat property with walls surrounding it now that's been retained. And I did this so that I could build a second dwelling unit. I now have the ready to issue permits. I literally walked out of Department of Building and Safety, walked back in to get my stamped approvals, and I was told that they couldn't approve my plans anymore. It was a disaster. I have to pay interest on the loans that I've taken out to build this second dwelling unit that I could rent out and increase the rental availability in the city that's really there's not much available but I can't now because of this situation we're in you guys can resolve it once you resolve it it'll go to city council by the end of the month and we can have it resolved good afternoon my name is Ron Bender uh, our situation is just like all the ones you've heard it's one of just basic fairness we're far along in the construction of a second dwelling that we have done lawfully in accordance with city issued permits and approved inspections every step of the way. For months now, we've been unable to proceed, which has been financially devastating for us. We have a structure that does not have a completed roof, so it's subject to ruin from the weather. Our contractors walked off the job and told us that he's not required to honor our original contract, given the lengthy delay and the cost that is imposed on him. And our neighbors are upset with us for having a partially built structure just sitting there. So we'd request that you uh, grant as requested and just basic fairness mandates that those who previously obtained building permits such as us be permitted to complete their projects as originally permitted. Thank you. Matthew Grigorczyk, John Grigorczyk. My name is Matthew Gregorczyk. Uh, I'm a builder and general contractor, and um, in the process, I have plans and about to issue permits. We've spent tens of thousands of dollars on um, design and permitting fees and taxes to get uh, a second dwelling bit, and I just uh, ask that you repeal the ordinance so that we can continue with our design. Thank you. After John is Ken Kurz, Michelle Kears, Beverly Palmer. Hi, my name is John Gregorchuk. I'm the homeowner, and Matthew is my contractor helping me build this project. Um, I just want to thank uh, Council Member Harris Dawson and your your uh, support with Steve uh, Garcia, just returning our calls and keeping us updated. Just either way, whatever you decide, I just really appreciate that there's been some form of communication. So thank you for that. Um, 
I just want to reiterate the grandfather statements. There's essentially three classes of people. There's the folks who paid plan check but did not issue a building permit. That's where I'm in. There's the folks who paid plan check and paid and received building permits and their projects are stopped. That's where the others are in. And then there's folks who completed building but are just waiting on their certificate of occupancy and those folks can't sell their property or rent their property. So I just really urge that this gets repealed and, and done quickly with a sense of urgency because like the others have said, our loans are coming due because construction loans are short-term loans and we're all left holding the bag. Um, and just I urge you not to be held captive by neighborhood councils that are elected by 50 or 70 people representing 50,000. So thank you. Ken Kurz, Michelle. Kears? Hello, Ken Kears, just uh, living in Van Nuys. Wanted to make sure that people understand what the issue is here that we have. We're not against second unit dwellings, especially those built by homeowners. I understand the need for students and elderly parents and things like that to be able to take care of them. But what we have with AB 1866 is maximum size for maximum profit. We have a two-story building in our back house. It peers right into our room and everything like that, but it's able to go up to 45 feet. Now that's not reasonable. It's also not affordable. Uh, the developer is gonna charge $3,000 for the front house, 3,800 for the back house. And I know affordable housing is a little bit of a catch word around here, especially with the mayor and the governor practically wet their pants. Um, but we know that do not that the 1866 default code will do nothing but result in a ton of houses that are too expensive for anyone to afford. Hello. Again, our opposition is not to second units. Our opposition is to a one-size-fits-all standard that allows 1,200 square foot, three bedroom, two bath, two story, full-size detached houses. These are not second units. These are full-size detached houses. Our opposition is to the assertion that these are the solution to affordable housing, even though there's no requirement for them to be rented at affordable housing. $3,800 is not affordable in the city of Van Nuys, California. There is a difference between a homeowner and a developer. Homeowners should be able to build these granny flats for health care for their family. But when developers come in here and build second houses, it's not about AB 1866 and the intent and the spirit of the law. It's about money, and that is it. Please do not allow this to become the standard. Please. Beverly Palmer, Lynn Kuwahara, Basilia Bustos Calderon. Hello, Beverly Palmer from Wasser and Wucher on behalf of Los Angeles Neighbors in Action. Uh, the city appears to be under a serious misunderstanding regarding the scope of the court's judgment in this case. I urge you to follow the judge's order, which said, you shall not issue any permits under ZA 120, which was the 2010 memo that was found invalid. There's no reason that the city needs to stop issuing all permits. The city can rely on its prior uh, practice of following its 2003 memorandum that laid out how to follow the local ordinance. And there is no reason why the city shouldn't be allowing people who had previously received permits under the uh, old memo to finish their construction as long as those permits were not appealed. That was never a part of the judge's ruling. Reliance on the state standards can be risky. The state can change the law. SB 1069, which currently uh, cleared the Senate floor, eliminates the need to provide parking uh, for many second dwelling units. And if that law passes, then if LA uses the local standards, the default standards, then its standards will reflect that state law as well. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Lynn Kuohara. I'm a CD10 resident. Um, I oppose the second units. Um, I feel Mr. Glesney from the May 12th meeting, he's like the BMW behind you in traffic, honking at you to keep moving, keep moving, get out of the way. And you get into an accident, but he goes scot-free. There, there's no reason to fast track this. Let's slow down and think about this. 
from the May 12th meeting, a lot of these people are just speculators. Even, I even say the people who say caregivers need a separate house. They, the owners want to keep their privacy and yet they want to invade my privacy by, by building a second unit in the back. If, this, if you do pass this thing, then please give CD10 a cutout because we had the corrupt and convicted inspector in in our area. Thank you. Thank you, Basilia Bustos Calderon, Maria Fisk, Charlie Hall, and Kathy Palmer. Yes, my name is Basilia Calderon. I support uh, the second unit. I live in a small house. I need more space. Please, thank you. Maria Fisk. Maria Fisk not here. Carlisle Hall. Kathy Palmer. And Sayed Saad. Good afternoon, I am Carlisle Hall, and I'm the uh, founder of uh, the plaintiff group that went to court to um, stop the city from uh, violating the second unit ordinances, its, its own adopted ordinances. And I'd say, first of all, that this, the city is the one who's created this crisis that people are talking about, this holding these people up. The judge specifically said that the, he, that the city should stop giving out permits consistent with the default standards the lenient permissive ones, but it should go ahead and give out permits according to the current ordinance. Well, that's more than 50% of the people in the pipeline, and yet the city's holding them up. With respect to the people who've already got their permits, the judge invalid, invalidated one permit. All the others are being stopped by the city, not by the judge, by the city. So they should be able to get through. And the, the City Council should insist that there be a, an adequate study of the alternatives. Here there almost are always alternatives, and yet you've really only been presented with repeal. Thank you. Kathy Palmer? Yes, I'm Kathy Palmer, and um, I'm uh, standing in for the president of the Bel Air Beverly Crest Neighborhood Council who had to leave. And she wrote a letter, and it's been submitted to the council file, um, that uh, basically says that they would like the... Um, the, the uh, planning department to continue with the June 23, 2003 interdepartmental correspondence memo instructions on page 2 of 2 which state that second dwelling units are not to be located in a hillside area in an equine keeping district along a scenic highway designated in the general plan in addition, in, in addition to other things including that uh, this neighborhood council is against a one size fits all approach and urges the city to slow down and do a thorough study of the options to the city. Um, they uh, are concerned that um, you, you just cannot apply a, a, a one-size-fits-all to the hillsides as you do to the flats. Um, there's enough development and destruction of the hillsides going on as it is right now, and um, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Sayed Saad, Nikki Miner, Robin Greenberg. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Sayed Trabzade. A year ago, I got a permit from the city to build a unit in my backyard. I started construction to build a unit to accommodate my caregivers who I depend on to get me ready in the morning to go to my job and later in the evening to go back to bed. I followed all the city's rules and regulations. I have been inspected and my project is ready. The only thing that is left is the certificate of occupancy that the city is not issuing. I have followed all the rules and regulations. I have done nothing wrong. I don't know why I have to be in this situation for the past three months that my project, which is ready, but I won't be able to use it. I encourage you and urge you to please pass this ordinance. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Nikki Miner, Robin Greenberg, Arthur Abakian. Nikki, whoops. Can't get this up. 
Nikki Miner, Bel Air Beverly Crest Neighborhood Council. To pass an ordinance like this, to do away with the Granny Flats ordinance, it does away with R1 zones. I mean, anyone with a backyard with space for another house in it is going to do it. We'll be giving over our city to Airbnb, the largest hotel um, corporation in the world that doesn't own any property because they use ours. Such a situation such as this older gentleman that needs uh, uh, to be near his family, these th hardships can be taken up on a one-by-one -one basis. You know, use a human approach, use a common sense approach. But to, to throw the chaos of everything becoming legal just because there's a whole bunch of them that are illegal makes no sense. All these new constructions will be a hardship on the city with infrastructure, with services, with resources. I mean, this just makes no sense. Please don't cause this chaos and ruin our one wonderful city. Thank you. Arthur Avakian, Herman, PDQ. Hello, Arthur Avakian. I hear a lot of good reasons why people should build second, store, second units in their backyards. My purpose, though, is for simply having my own home. The only way we can afford our own home is to buy one, build one in the back, rent it out to supplement the mortgage that we have to pay. This is the only way me and my wife, with our modest income, would be able to own a house here in Los Angeles where homes are so expensive. Otherwise, we'd have to be a renter like we are currently. And if there is a way, legally, that is you know, part of your rules and regulations that we can do so. That's what we wanted to do. That's why we bought the house as expensive as it is, only for its intrinsic value. If we were not able to do what we had planned to do, which was allowed by you initially, we would have never bought this house in this economy at this kind of price. We would have maybe looked forward to buying a house in Arizona or Las Vegas where it was more affordable. We did this after we did our due diligence and found that we can build a second unit. Please do not take this away from us. Thank you. PDQ, Azuro Malin, Joshua Chavez. Yes, took their money and didn't give them the certificate of occupancy. Typical city hall. Trying to come in and get something you're entitled to. These people spent their money. They played your game. Maybe they paid off the inspectors. I'm just saying it could be hypothetical. And now they're not getting their certificate of occupancy. What is wrong? This is bad business. This is against the mafia code. Chicago's going to be angry when they get the emails tonight. When I tell them, hey, Donnie, they ain't giving them their certificate of occupancy. Maybe we're going to have to charter a jet over there and get them people on. Give them their certificate of occupancy. The people in the pipeline, let them build their shit, put the rest on hold, and let the individual cases come in after. Joshua Chavez, Julia Duncan, and Ackley Padilla. I'm just here to say that I'm in favor of second dwellings. Um, I, it, it, it is a source that provides affordable housing. Um, I see it day in, day out. Um, Pacoima, Arlita, um, there's a lot of uh, illegal units that we see, and this is a way of providing housing that's, um, that, that is to building code and something that it will be safe for people. Um, unlike other, other parts of LA, um, people do need affordable housing. Maybe not Bel Air, but we do. Okay? I am in favor of second dollars. Thank you. Leah Duncan from CD4 and Ackley Padilla. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for having me. Julia Duncan, Councilman David Rue. Uh, the City Planning Commission's recommendation does not adequately analyze the available options the city could pursue in order to bring the existing city ordinance into compliance with both AB 1866 and the recent Superior Court order. In lieu of a reactive repeal of the existing ordinance, options are available that would not only preserve neighborhood character and protect single-family homes, but also provide the much-needed housing, additional housing that our city needs. The current ordinance should not be repealed, but rather applied ministerially per the state law through a severability analysis or amended to eliminate the discretionary uh, approvals and include multi-family zones. 
Repeal of the ordinance would default the city to the more lenient state standards and sacrifice the protections offered by the city ordinance. It is equally important to the council member in our office that applications and permits issued and construction underway prior to the Superior Court's order and issued per the 2003 Interdepartmental Correspondence or ZA Memo 120 be granted legal nonconforming status. Uh, an ordinance should be drafted that grants legal nonconforming status to those SDUs issued through the previous memos and addresses the conflicting provisions of the city's SDU ordinance without eliminating the existing pro uh, protections. Thank you. Thank you. Ackley Padilla, CD6. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Uh, today we're just here on behalf of Councilwoman Nuri Martinez uh, asking the Plum Committee to consider a different approach than what's being recommended by CPC and the Planning Department. Um, the conversation today about second dwelling units came out of the lawsuit uh, over the past two years. Um, and as a result of that lawsuit, the judge determined that following the processes under ZA 120 was invalid. So we've got to fix that. And I don't think anybody disagrees with that. Uh, Councilwoman Martinez submitted a letter to the committee, uh, and I have extra copies if you need it. In that letter, she outlined some recommendations on a path forward uh, to do just that. What the conversation ends up taking us to, however, is what set of standards apply to second dwelling units. Um, some are going to argue that we should continue the standards that were utilized under ZA 120, but we have to keep in mind, in the same vein that the judge said how we got to using ZA 120 was invalid, there's also questions about how the standards within ZA 120 uh, and whether or not those are the process that we used to get there was also invalid. Prior to ZA 120, from 2003 to 2010, we were using the standards that were listed in our municipal code. We somehow took a big jump with the ZA memo. There was no local legislative action taken to adopt those standards here in Los Angeles. I know the state of California took action under 1866, but here in Los Angeles, we never made a policy decision to do just that. We just started implementing it under ZA 120. With that being said, I think <clears throat> the question again becomes, which set of standards apply? If there's questions on how we came to ZA 120, I think there's also questions on how we came to the standards within ZA 120. Rather than repealing and leaving us vulnerable to a looser set of standards, listed in AB 1866, the more prudent approach would be to correct the current ordinances to make them comply with 1866, leaving the set of standards that are currently in place. With that, we can then have a discussion down the road, a more open and thorough discussion on how that set of standards works or does not work and whether or not those need to be changed. But we should be careful on how we move forward. Again, our concern is simply, if we take the act to repeal, we're going to leave many of our neighborhoods vulnerable to a set of standards that may not preserve, respect, and recognize the character of individual neighborhoods across Los Angeles. If we want to have that discussion down the road, we should. Until then, however, let's take one step forward and simply correct the current ordinances to make them comply, leave the current set of standards that are very protective right now in place, and then allow for the conversation down the road. Again, the letter from Councilwoman Martinez has been circulated. I have extra copies if you need it. We simply ask that the Plum Committee consider those recommendations as an alternative approach instead of the CPC recommendation to simply repeal the ordinances. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that's our final speaker. Um, I have a number of questions, but first let's go to the City Attorney. Do you have something to say? Uh, Terry Coppa, Messiah City Attorney's Office. Um, I have uh, Stephen Blau here. He's the attorney who handled the litigation and is familiar with uh, what the court said and this issue and wanted to okay, um, sure. address the committee. Uh, good, af uh, good afternoon, uh, honorable committee members. Steve Blau, deputy city attorney in the land use division. I wanted just to make certain that the committee is aware of what the court's order is. Uh, there's been some commentary here about how it's it, that, that, that the city should automatically go back to the standards in 1224W43. That was a position that was strenuously argued by the plaintiffs in this case. 
that the court must issue declaratory relief that those standards be adopted. And the court specifically rejected that argument. The court rejected that argument, but then went on to say that it's not that the city couldn't do it, but that before the city went forward, it would need to take some discretionary action. So in the court's words, it states, uh, petitioner contends that declaratory relief must issue ordering the city to enforce LAMC section 1224W43's uh, more restrictive standards. But these standards cannot be enforced without some discretionary city action. And the courts then said that the discretionary city action that the city may take in its discretion would be either to repeal what's on the books and default to the state standards, uh, amend 1224W43 going forward or enact what the council or what the committee thinks are the appropriate standards on a forward going basis, or perform some type of severability analysis severing out the pieces of the existing ordinance that don't comply with state law. So there are various options that can be pursued. It's just that some discretionary action is needed before the city's policy can be enforced. The concern that our office has is the time that it's going to take to take that discretionary action. In the interim, you have people who are in the middle of development and people who are also in the plan check process that are waiting for that policy to be enunciated by the city. I'm uh, here to answer any other questions. And, and remind us, uh, did, I'm trying to remember myself, did this go before full council in closed session? Uh, no, there was, uh, uh, this has not been, not been before council. Well, in housing committee there was a discussion. Uh, yes, this went to house. Was direction given to the city attorney uh, or the planning department uh, as to which direction we would want to go with respect to the options available to us, whether we rely on state legislation, severability, or we amend the ordinance? Uh, the housing committee, uh, after the housing committee met, there was an allegation that there was a Brown Act violation, so the housing committee did hold a second meeting to hold that violation, uh, to, to cure that alleged violation. I believe, although I don't have the report in front of me, that housing committee, uh, elected to have that portion of its report sent off to council. Council has not hold, held a hearing on that. Independent of what housing had heard and directed, the Department of City Planning initiated its own ordinance and the policy choices are set forth in the planning department's report. That planning ordinance is what had gone through CPC and is now before this committee. So what's before us today uh, in this committee? What, what do you have before us today? There's a draft ordinance uh, by the planning department that recommends what? Uh, it recommends repealing 1224 W43 and 44, which are the second unit ordinances that are on the books right now, and grandfathering in those units that had been approved underneath the 2003 memorandum and the 2010 memorandum, which would collectively allow those people who are in the plan check process or are also under construction to complete their units and by repealing what's on the books, the city would automatically default to state law until further legislation was enacted. Okay, and that's what's before us today, okay. Any questions or comments? Um, I Ms. move the planning department's uh, recommendations and ordinance. Okay, there's been a, um, a motion and a second to move the planning department's um, ordinance, and procedurally, I wanna clarify something. Um, should we approve this, it then goes to the city attorney's office for drafting to form a legality. Now, do we keep that in council, in committee, or do we send that to full council before it goes to the city attorney's office? The it comes to the city attorney's office first, and then it, it comes back. To this committee? Yeah, unless you want to wave it out because you've already heard it. And, and, I mean, the and, ordinance is there, so you have it. So. Okay, I, and I want to clarify that. Maybe this is a discussion, a broader discussion that we need to have with the city attorney's office because I've been on this committee for 10 years and we've often done that procedurally. But I've been told in the last year or so, probably last two years, that the city attorney will not take any draft ordinance from the planning department from this committee unless it goes to council first. So this is news to me now and I just want to clarify what the procedures are. No, that's the general procedure for, for ordinances generally, but not for the land use ordinances. 
Not for what? Not for the land use ordinances, not, not for the ones that come here. But if there are other ordinances that are going forward in the city, they go to full council and then full council instructs. But here, it's the, this committee gives the instruction. So any committee that comes out of here is pretty much a land use ordinance, no? Any ordinance that comes out of this out committee? Of this committee. Pretty much. I mean, it should be. <laughs> okay. I just want to clarify that, and I'm speaking about this publicly as opposed to having a sidebar conversation because I've been frustrated about the different directions we've gone. It's not you, just generally the different direction we've gone from the city attorney's office as to when they want something to go to the full council for approval before they start working on an ordinance. Well, my understanding is this committee that has the, the different process. Okay. So this committee, we could direct the city attorney to uh, draft the ordinance, keep it here until that city ordinance comes back uh, as approved by formal legality by the city attorney's office and we can move That's forward right. from them. That's okay. correct. Okay. Mr. Thank Chair, you. any idea yeah. on how uh, fast that can be done? Because this is a, a problem now that has existed for some time and there is uh, increasing uncertainty and frustration with the issue. A any idea from the city attorney's office how soon? It seems that it wouldn't take very much to get the ordinance going. Well, I, I don't think it'll take very long. I mean, we'll move with all due haste on it. I mean, because we, we've looked at it, so. Okay, great. Thank you. Just some questions as... Um, before we move forward and we have some further clarification, how do other cities regulate their SDUs? Uh, I believe planning had... Or, or major... Uh, just briefly, we don't have to go to... Yeah, depth. we just had a little bit of research done to see which number, how many number of cities in the state of California use um, 1866, and I think we mentioned that out of the 482 cities in, in the state, and over 90% of them just default to the state standards. 90% default to the state over standards. Over 90%, yes. So we'll be in compliance with most cities in California. That is correct. Okay. And um, would the repeal <clears throat> allow any ADU units in the hillside areas by right? Uh, yes, it would, as long as they followed the, the state standards. So the state standards allows SD units by right, right. on it, hillsides? Yes, it does. But What's again, the policy behind that? But why, it, why? Um, again, the state was not trying to kind of further restrict the opportunities to build um, secondary dwelling units. I would remind everybody, though, that in addition to the, second, to the state standards, they still are subject to all of the limitations of our, of our zoning code in terms of height, setback, other kind of provisions that might be particular so to other, the hillside areas. Other protections. That's right. correct. Okay. Now, um, for building and safety, how many do we have actually in plan check right now? Good evening or good afternoon, as council members. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we ran the report. That was funny, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I can see right now. Anyway, um, we ran the report, and it, approximately we have about 300, 380 jobs in plan check right now. How many? 380. 380. 80. Yeah. And how many of those are over 640 uh, square feet? Approximately 300. 300 are, are over yes. 640. And on a hillside? Hills, you know? uh, we have 73 projects on in hillside area. And, and how many, do we know how many ADUs were constructed under the CA memo 120? I mean, if you, that's we a... Have, uh, we have to run some numbers, but uh, altogether we have issued 555 uh, second dwelling unit permits, and out of that, about 450 are under uh, ZA 120. Okay. And of the, the ones that have under plan check, do we know how many are actually under construction? Oh, if it's Part in plan check, they're waiting to pull the permit and that will go to construction. But oh. we already issued permits and there are uh, 368 projects are under construction right now. Okay. And so there's a, a number on hold. And um, so the idea then is to, as soon as we approve this legislation, uh, those are there will then immediately start. I mean, they're they're deemed to move forward. Yes, and but actually, they're on hold right now. Those three something are on hold. Uh, we got advice from this uh, our legal counsel. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Steve Lau, deputy city attorney. Um, what what the uh, judgment of the court is is that the city is enjoined from issuing permits under. Uh, ZA Memo 120. 
So oh, what Building and Safety has been doing is if a permit had issued prior to the order, remember construction can't start until a permit is issued, the permits would have issued, there would be no violation by allowing that construction to go forward. So Building and Safety has been allowing that construction to go forward, recognizing that at the end of the road when you're done with your construction and you've complied with the terms of your approved permit, you would get a certificate of occupancy. <clears throat> and that construction has been going forward and Building and Safety has been giving, asking people to sign something that they've... And that point is very important, I think, because, and hopefully the applicants have heard that, because I've gotten calls to my office saying, hey, I can't proceed, I'm waiting for you guys to move forward, but apparently they, some of these can actually continue. They, sh uh, they should have heard that. There was a gentleman here who said he sh he's not able to get a CFO. I believe he should be able to get a CFO. Okay. But in the interest of transparency and making sure that those people who move forward with the projects know that the court's order is out there, uh, Building and Safety has been asking people to sign something to acknowledge that they've received a copy of that order. Now, Building and Safety, you are... You understand that, and that is the information you're relaying to people who are in the process? Yes, that, we are. Okay. And some, some people choose not to sign that statement, so they are afraid that if they sign the statement, they will lose some rights, so oh, yeah. they are choosing not to do construction or continue with construction. I, I, yeah, I've also heard that as well. Okay. And, and that's a separate circumstance than those people who are in plan check. People who are in plan check have come, paid their fees, and are trying to get their uh, applications up until the point where they comply with the building and safety regulations. Those people have also been given the option of moving forward with plan check, uh, have also been asked to sign something that they've received a copy of the court's order. But they're in a different situation because at the end of the road, building and safety cannot issue a permit under ZA Memo 120. So they go up to the issuance of permits uh, stage and they are waiting for this ordinance to get repealed. Once we repeal, then they can pull the permits. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. And so the urgency for us is that there's a number of these projects that have the right to move forward and construct, but we cannot issue the permit for them until we have this legislation in place. But we're going in a parallel track, it sounds to me, until we move, approve the new legislation. That is good. Okay. okay, so. Uh, that needs to get out there. I think there's a lot of confusion about this, and um, and, and that information needs to dis disseminate a little bit better. But um, okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, well, well, so we will. Uh, well, yes. Well, one more comment, if I might, Steve Blau, Deputy City Attorney. I want to make sure that there's no confusion in the record about what the committee would want to do in terms of grandfathering in or giving people the rights to go forward with projects. Um, there are those that have permits already and are continuing with projects, and those also that have applied for permits, have paid their fees, are in the middle of plan check, but don't have permits. So they're two separate groups. And it would be helpful for the record uh, to know what the policy choice is in terms of whether only one of those um, groups would be entitled to proceed, neither or both. Is that, is that I clear? Think, I think both are entitled to pr proceed forward. Uh, I think that's the intent, and I don't know if legally there are any rights attached to them paying fees and and, but, if, but if they were in the process already, and I think it would be unfair to, to, to remove them at this point. That's, I'd leave it up to Mr. my colleagues. Mr. Mr. Chair, as the maker of the motion, I would uh, clarify that that was the intention of my motion to include both classes. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments? For those of you in the audience, if you have any further questions or comments or you could talk to either our city attorney or um, our building safety or planning department personnel. Um, anything else? We got a vote? Okay. So, we're, any objections to Mr. Fuentes and Harris Dawson motion? See no objections, so ordered. And to clarify, this is going to the city attorney for um, approval to form a legality, and it will return to Plum. And in the future, that's also a valid way of uh, moving forward on ordinances. So for clarification, it's, it's not moving to council. It's being continued. 
I'm sorry, I did not hear that. For clarification, it is not moving to council at this time. It's being continued. Yes. Okay, thank you. You see, she recalls everything moving to council before it comes back here. Yes. So we're correcting our own uh, different processes that we've created. Thank you. Um, any other uh, business before this committee? Uh, public comment, Councilor. Public comment. Um, okay. PDQ. Public comment. There's no PDQ here. Okay. There's a PDQ here. Yes, so everybody's confused. We're going back to state standards, right? Sir, in public comment, you cannot speak on any item that was on well, the agenda I, today. Okay, I mean... Anything just, else having to do with land use in the city of Los Angeles, you're open to it. Yes, okay. So we just want to know what happened here and make sure that if, in the future, when we pull a permit sir, and one pays for fees... Sir, um, ...to build, that somebody should get something for their money, Right? If you walk into a store and you buy a TV, you don't get a pen, you get a TV. If you go into your city, your plan check, your unified departments, and they pay for a building permit, why the hell aren't they getting their, their stuff done or not getting a refund? You guys got to get smart. That's stealing money. That's embezzlement. That's not, that's not a game. You're taking away people's lives. So when they pay for these things, give them their entitlement. If you're not, please give them a prompt refund. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes this meeting. Thank you very much.